Well done, dear. We got away without too much trouble. And it does it. Wait a minute. Have you heard the weird tales of the Whistler? Sunday night, and again, CBS presents The Whistler. I, The Whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And so I tell you the amazing story of House of Greed. A taxi cab rolls through the night and comes to a stop before a brownstone mansion on West 52nd Street. The driver opens the door. A handsome, well-dressed man steps out, pays the driver, slips quickly up the stairs, fumbles with a bunch of keys, but the door opens. Oh. Hello, Jackson. Mr. Talbot, welcome home. Where's Mrs. Talbot? Oh, uh, she left three days ago. Uh, went to the place in the Catskill. There's a note on your desk. Uh, oh, good. Your brother, Frank, is waiting in the library. Oh. Oh, Frank? What do you want? Yeah. Now, look, Frank, I told you the last time I'd give you no more money. Oh, but it isn't gambling debts this time. I'm reforming. I'm going to settle down and work. Work? I met a big cattleman from South America. He has a very lovely daughter. And she talked her father into letting me buy an interest in the business. How much? Ten thousand. Oh, I'm sure I'll make good, John. Oh, very well. I don't mind doing something like that for you. When are you leaving? Tomorrow. I've had a plane reservation for four days. <laughs> Thanks for the check, John. You're a swell guy. Uh, tell Mary goodbye for me. Yeah, she's up in the Catskills. Yeah, so Jackson told me. Okay. Good Lord. What's wrong? She hasn't gone to the Catskills. I... I can't understand this. What on earth does she mean? Well, what is it? Read it. John, this life is too lonely. I can't go on like this, so I'm leaving you. I found someone else who is more considerate of me. First, I'm going home, and from there, it doesn't matter. I'm sorry, but things just didn't work out. No. Someone who's more considerate of her, why, I have given Mary everything her heart desired. She must be out of her mind. Uh. Of course, you have been gone a lot, and women get crazy ideas. It snuck the pins right up from under me. Yes, I can see that. Better take it easy for a while. Yes, I feel, I don't know, kind of sick. All of a sudden, nothing seems to matter. Well, maybe she'll wake up before she gets too far. Perhaps I'd better cancel my trip for a few weeks until you get straightened out. No, 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 never mind. I'll pull myself together. I wouldn't have you sidetrack your plans for the world. I think you better go now, thanks. All right. But uh, don't do anything foolish. What do you mean? Well, if you brood about it, you're liable to get some crazy ideas and end up really holding the sack. Good luck, Frank. Lots of luck. Thanks. Goodbye, John. John sits for the remainder of the night, staring over the top of his desk. The next morning, he closes the house and starts on Mary's trail, which takes him to London, Paris, Berlin, all over Europe, but no avail. Finally, he drops his active interest in his business and goes to live in his country estate. But one day, 14 years later, he finds himself on a honeymoon. He has married a widow named Hilda. Well done, dear. We got away without too much trouble. Well, it does seem a bit silly, rice and honeymoons at our age. Our age? Well, you sound as though we're a couple of old grannies. I'm 36 and you're 45, and I certainly don't feel old. Well, of course you're not, Helga. <laughs> oh, yes. John, now that the wedding's over, there's something I haven't told you. Oh, I... now I... I... Well, I, I haven't said anything because I was afraid it, it might make a difference. I know what it is. You have a son... 
Did you know? <laughs> I wondered when you were going to mention it. Oh, well, he finished his school this year. It's been quite a struggle putting him through college. But he's very bright. Paul has studied hard and managed to cram two years into one. Could he spend the summer with us? Why, of course. Oh, John, you're a darling. I should be able to find a place for him in the business. Oh, ask him to come down to our place in the country. Oh, thanks, John. You're wonderful. <laughs> So Helga's son, Paul, came to spend the summer at the country place. And he stayed the next winter and the following summer and the next winter. Now it is summer again. And Paul is still visiting his mother and stepfather. The first year, he worked in the office every day until noon. The farm business very boring. So finally, he could go to the city at all. But, Mother, I've looked the whole thing over and there's nothing there that interests me. Well, you can learn about the business. You seem to be able to learn anything else you want to. But I don't care for business. Oh, you're a fool. I worked my knuckles to the bone to give you an education. I married John Talbot to give you a chance, a chance to do something. John has no children. It's a huge business. And one day you could control the whole thing. I'm disappointed in you, Paul. You're letting me down. Well, it seems to run very well without too much attention to him. If we were to uh, inherit it, why wouldn't it continue to run just as well? You either get down to that office or you pack your things and get out. Why should I? I'm perfectly satisfied. I'll tell John to make you go. Well, suppose I tell him what you just said? That you married him just to give me a chance? Married him for his money? He wouldn't. And uh, suppose I tell him that you were never divorced from father. But he's still down in South America. Still wandering around trying to find a coal mine. If you dare open your mouth, I'll... Helga, what's this I heard about South America? Oh, why, why, nothing, darling. Paul was just talking about someone he met from down there. Who do you know from South America, Paul? Oh, a uh, oh, fellow. I met him today. Were you in the city today? Uh, no, uh, I was down the village. I didn't suppose you'd been out of the house today. What's his name? Why, uh, I don't remember. I didn't think you would. You haven't been out of this house for three days. Paul, I think you're the laziest man I've ever met. All right, all right. I'll start back to the office Monday. If that's what you and Mother want me to do, I'll do it. Sorry I wasn't here for dinner, Helga. I was detained in town. I have quite a bit of work to do. I'll be here in the library for two or three hours. Very well, John. I, I won't bother you. I'll go on upstairs. Besides, I want to have a little talk with Paul. Good night, dear. Good night, Helga. <clears throat> what Who's out there? Why? What do you want out there? May I come in? I want to talk with you. Why do you come to the library windows? Why didn't you ring the bell? I, I didn't want to call the disturbance. Disturb? What do you mean? May I come in? Yes, yes, come ahead. Don't you know me, darling? There. I'm sorry, John. I had to talk to you. I'm all right, my boy. What do you want? I, I need your help. Where have you been all these years? Oh, every place. I was still here with you. Been too long ago. First I was. I followed you all over Europe, but never quite caught up with you. Oh, I'm glad I did. No telling what I might have done. I'm sorry, John. I was I know that means. <laughs> 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 of course. Yeah. 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 See, I hate to mention it, but you look a bit shabby, Mary. What are you doing, what? Oh. Yes. Yes, I'm Are you? Yes, uh, married again. Yes. Yes. And I'll be as brief as possible. I wouldn't want her to know that I was here. You want me to help your husband? No. Not that. I have no husband. What about the man you said was more considerate of you? He left me four years after the baby was born. Baby? You have a child. Yes, John. She's 17 now. And where's the man? I don't know, and I don't care. Oh, John, I made the biggest mistake of my life. I should have known better. 
He practically carried me off my feet. I learned later. He was not worth shooting. Where's your daughter? She's in a school in Vermont. I've worked hard to give her an education. I've done everything I could do to give her a chance. I've not seen her very often. But now, well, I... I'm sort of cracking up. I didn't know the lot. I think they have trouble getting a job. Job? What kind of a job? Why, any kind of a job. What have you been working at now? I was never able to face them. I always took the line of least interesting. But now I've come to the end of my work. Joan is finished school. She's a lovely girl. I can't let her know. I can't take her with me. Why not? She deserves too much more. She deserves a chance in life. I want you to do something for her. But why should I? She's your daughter, darling. Yeah. My daughter? Yes, yours and mine. She was born seven months after I left. Here's the birth certificate. Please, John, do something for her. She shouldn't be made to suffer for mine, please. She's innocent. Oh, does she know I'm her father? <laughs> no. She doesn't remember the other man. Here, I'll give you her address. Fernwood College. And, and I'll write a letter to her explaining all about you. Well, I... I... Oh, John, you've been doing so much for her. She's a young lady now. Please, please, dear. I know you're fell in love with her. All right, Mary, I'll see her. I'll have her come down here. Oh, John. John, I'm so sorry. So sorry for everything I've done. Please, please. I've forgotten everything, Mary. Oh, wait a moment. I'll take this check... And do something about that cough. No, thanks, John. I won't need it. You better take it. Thanks. I'll be all right in a few days. The cough will be gone. Good night, John. Good night, Mary. If he brings this girl here, do you realize what it means, Mother? Yes. It's his own daughter. If he falls for her, if he, if he likes her, he'll change his will and split the estate. She's entitled to it, isn't she? Now, why should she be? Strange girl he didn't even know existed. Popped up out of nowhere and cheats us out of half the estate. I know what you mean. We've been here for several years. You're his wife. It isn't fair. What would you do about it, Paul? I'd see that she didn't get anything. How would that be possible? Suppose she, uh, she didn't like it. Supposing that the poor John got attached to her. The things happen that would make her dislike everything. If she runs away soon enough, he won't change his will. Perhaps you're right. And if she doesn't? Then maybe something could happen to John. And later, something could happen to the girl. But in any event, the will must not be changed. Where do you get such ideas? <laughs> That, Joan, dear, is the story of your mother. I trailed them all over Europe, but never quite caught up with them. You mean you planned to kill them? Kill them? I was filled with revenge, but I finally gave up the chase and returned here to wait. I knew that sooner or later she'd show up. But it's been so long ago. Surely you've lost the desire for revenge by this time. Time heals many wounds, my dear. If you had caught up with them and satisfied your revenge, what good would it have done? Quite right, my dear, quite right. Tell me, have you no recollection of this man? You can recall nothing about him? Absolutely nothing. Remember, I was only four when he went away. And you do believe that I'm your father? What else am I to believe? Mother proved that with the birth certificate. Proved that I'm Joan Talbot, not Joan Evans, as I've always believed. Of course. And would you like to remain here? Why, yes, I, I think I would, there but There seems I... to be a doubt. Why do you hesitate? I don't know. From all the evidence, I, I belong here. I, I have a legal right, but... Well, I can't seem to find words to express it. Express what? From the moment I stepped in the door of this house, I've had a, a strange feeling. A cold, chilly sensation of 
of fear. Well, is it something you feel about me? Yes. You're afraid of me? No, I, I don't think so. Is it Helga? Well... Is it Paul? Oh, please, please don't ask me anymore. I don't know what it is. Well, what has Paul said to you? Nothing. No one said anything. Just a premonition of... Something wrong. Something horribly wrong in this house. Oh, you're imagining things, Joan. It's all in your mind. It will pass as suddenly as it came. You're young, Joan, impressionable, and you suddenly found your life turned upside down. A new environment to which you've never become accustomed. But you'll get used to it. You're my daughter. And I want you to have what you deserve, what is rightfully yours. I understand. And I'll try to overcome your feelings. Yeah, that's better. You're a lovely girl, Joan. An intelligent girl. I know I'm going to be very proud of you. Thank you. I think I'll go to bed now. <laughs> it is rather late. Good night, dear. See you in the morning. Hello. Oh. What are you doing here on the stairs in the dark? I wanted to tell you something. What? You're very, very beautiful. You don't like me either, do you? Well, I... I know. I can tell you. Most people don't like me either. Who's else is? A girl. You know it. She went to the cemetery. No one knows what became of her. What? I don't remember what happened to her. But her throat was slender and white. Let me by. Joan. Oh, Joan. What? Who's here? Who's in this room? Don't turn on the light. Helga. What do you want? I must talk to you. What about? Maybe. No one is safe in this house. You must leave it alone. What do you mean? What's wrong? The house is wrong. It's filled with evil and hate. I know. Why do you say? I can't believe it to me. But you must go at once. Do you mean that Paul? And what else? John. John? What about it? But you must believe it. What about my father? Do you believe he is your father? And he's planning to get revenge on your mother and lose you. I don't believe you. I don't. Yes, wait while you have a chance. No. I don't know if I'll I'll face it, whatever it is. Right. Now it is nearly midnight. John still works at his desk in the library. On the terrace, quietly opens the library door. Sips in. Hello, John. Frank. What do you want? Yeah, Brother Frank. <laughs> well, why don't you say something? Come in, uh, get out, or something? Why, well, come in, Frank. You fairly knocked me off my feet. I didn't know whether you were alive or dead. It's been a long time, John. Why haven't you written me? Well, I was hoping I could make a go of that ranch and pay you back, but. I guess I was just born unlucky. They had a revolution and cleaned Senor Gonzalez out and me with it. Too bad. But you're still the same steady, reliable guy. Yes, sir. I was down just to be like this. Well, it just isn't in me. I don't have what it takes. The last two years, I've had a pretty tough time. I caught some sort of a malarial fever down there, and it's impossible to get rid of it. It's recurring. You certainly don't look well. You've aged quite a bit. You better have Dr. Richards look you over tomorrow. <laughs> He's still kicking around. I thought he'd be gone long ago. 
How's your new marriage turned out? Oh, very well. Very well indeed. Good. Ever hear from Mary? Yes. She came to see me. I knew she would eventually. She was broken quite ill. She'd had a tough time of it. And you helped her out. <laughs> you were. You couldn't turn anyone down. Well, she was mainly interested in my helping the girl. She had her in the school of the month. And so now you're taking care of both of them. What else could I do? Good old girl. Sent for the girl and brought her down here. She's a lovely child. Sweet as can be. And you'll give her everything her heart desires, I suppose. And then you'll have another problem on your hands with Joan. A girl 17 either wants to get married or go to college. Oh? I've decided that. <laughs> really? I'd like to send her to Wellesley. Good. There isn't every man who can have... Just a minute, Frank. I'll be right back. Well... What are you doing out here in the hall? Oh, well, uh, uh, mother sent me down. She's probably have to come up to your room. Oh. Tell her I'll be up in a few minutes. Yes, 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 I'll tell her. Step son, four. Mother thought I was staying up unusually late. Oh, well, I'll run along. Good heavens, it's after 12. Now, when's the last train back to the city? 12 o'clock, you missed it. Well, when's the next one? 5 a.m. Oh. oh, I suppose I'll have to wait for that. Can you put me up? Yes, of course, Frank. Oh, thanks. Well, wait a moment, Frank. I probably won't be up when you leave, so I'll give you this now. Oh, now, John, I uh, I didn't come here for that. Mm -hmm. I, well, that is not exactly. <laughs> no, you never have. Okay, well, thank you. And see Doc Richards first thing in the morning. And drop in at the office and let me know what he says. Thanks, John. I, I'm sorry that I have to take this. But I only wish that I had to get it kids any longer. You're too old to learn new tricks now. Well, I'll bet, Frank. I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, so, uh, take the guest room at the head of the stairs. Good night, John. See you in town at noon. Night, Frank. clock strikes three as two figures slip down the darkened hall and quietly enter John's bedroom. Then a few minutes later, the same two figures make their way in the moonlight through the trees to the back of the estate, carrying a long, gruesome bundle wrapped in a sheet. <laughs> now it is three nights later, and Joe, Helga, and Paul are in the library. Joan paces back and forth, anxious. Where could Father have gone? He didn't say a word about going out of town. Oh, maybe he doesn't want to come back. Why not? Mm, I don't know. Maybe he doesn't like it here. It is different for you. But you didn't say anything about it. Well, well, you just mentioned me. Is it a mistake? You just had a weird feeling of intending to Something is wrong, I know. But I didn't know. If I could leave, I'd not stay another moment. You know what's I know. What do you know? I know what'll happen next. What is happening to you? Many people have come here, stayed a while, and then suddenly disappeared. What time is it? There's a train at 12. I'm leaving here. Hello? Yes, this is Joan Talbot. What? Yes. Yes, I understand. Yes, I'll, I'll be here. Yes. Who was it? Oh, I don't know. I've never heard anything else. What do you mean? The man is... What man? He said he had a message for you. And he'll be here at 12 o'clock and... We're in the middle of the place. I don't know. And then he'll come to the garden window. The library window. Look at the city. I know. I'm going to come back to the Through the garden. Who? 
Who is it, Mother? I don't know. The lights. Why did you turn out the lights? I turned them out so we could be outside. Who is he? I don't know. He's up on the terrace. Who, who are you? What do you want? What about? About what happened here at three o'clock in the morning several days ago. Nothing happened. Nothing. But something did happen. Turn on the light. No. Don't turn them on. You couldn't see me if you turned on the light. Oh, good Lord. Was it you who phoned me? I spoke to you, but I didn't phone you. Mother. What happened in this house at three o'clock several days ago? A man was murdered. What? Paul. Oh. Turn on the lights. Turn on the lights. Joan Talbot. Open the top drawer of that desk. Now take out the paper. It says, on the night of August 5th, we, the undersigned, murdered John Talbot in his bedroom and buried his body on the estate. We didn't. We didn't. It's John. It's John. Sign it. Sign the paper and I'll go. Sign it. Sign it. You did it. You killed him. Sign it. You help me. You sign it. Turn on the lights, John. It's him. It's him. He isn't dead. No, Paul. Yeah, we didn't. Paul, what happened? I'll tell you. You killed my brother Frank instead. Come on in, Sergeant. You heard it all. Yes, we heard it all. Father, what on earth happened? When you phoned a while ago, I almost told you. I was sure you were dead. I knew from the moment you told me you were frightened in this house that something was wrong. I put two and two together and realized what it was. I didn't want you to share on the estate. I knew they were planning something on that night. And then my brother came. He accidentally got into my room by mistake. And they killed him instead of me. I saw them carrying his body through the trees. So I disappeared for a few days and evolved this plan. You have nothing to worry about any longer, Joe. Nothing. No. <laughs> nothing to worry about. But the truth would certainly amaze you. All that Helga said about Paul and John was true. John was planning revenge, but not through Joe. That night your brother Frank came back. You discovered something, John. What was it Frank said? And then you'll have another problem on your hands with Joe. A girl 17 neither wants to get married or go to college. It was then, John, that you knew the truth. The only way that Frank could have possibly known that the girl's name was Joan and that she was 17 was to have been with Mary. So John knew then that it was Frank who ran away with Mary and deserted her when Joan was four years old. And then, John, knowing that Helga and Paul planned to kill him, deliberately let Frank occupy his room on that fateful night. John's revenge was satisfied. He didn't have to turn a hand. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> CBS has presented The Whistler. And now an important announcement regarding a change of time. Beginning one week from tomorrow night, on Sunday, September 13th, The Whistler will come to you at 9.15 p.m. Remember, Sunday, September 13th, at 9.15 p.m. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originates from Columbia Square in Hollywood. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Whistler. Now, the Whistler's strange story. 
Murder in Paradise. High in the Sierra, the lone hawk circled over Mirror Lake. Its beady eyes fixed on a white patch moving slowly through the blue waters below. From the narrow road that ran along the lake's edge, another pair of eyes followed the patch of white. Watched the girl emerge from the water and remove the white bathing cap. Saw the mass of red hair fall on tan shoulders, now glistening in the bright sunlight. The eyes belonged to Danny Williams, who stood there looking at the girl in the yellow bathing suit. Then as she sat down at the edge of the long wooden pier, he shifted the heavy suitcase from one hand to the other and started through the trees toward it. As he emerged at the edge of the lake, he walked into the range of another pair of eyes looking through field glasses, trained on the scene from a point a quarter of a mile away. Hello. I'm looking for Paradise Inn. You know where it is? Huh? You a salesman? Do I look like one? You went away. Are you? In a way. I don't think they'll be interested in buying any brushes. Thanks for the tip, but I'm still looking for the inn. Got a cigarette? Sure. I'm smoking it. How'd you ever get to be so charming? Look, Red, they told me in the village the inn was a mile up the road. So you know. Why come to the lake to ask me? There's a bathing suit. On the road, I couldn't believe it. Like it? It seemed more material than a penny like that. <laughs> the inn's over there. Take the side road. Thanks. See it? Nothing wrong with my eyes. From the way you've been staring at me, I thought you might have strained them. A quarter of an hour later, you arrive at the roadhouse. A low white frame building sitting back silently in the shadows of the giant redwood. This is it, isn't it, Sam? Paradise Inn. Where you're going to spend the next three months pounding the piano for Johnny Hedges. Your first job, Danny, since the prison gates closed behind you, gave you back your freedom. And you've made up your mind that it will never happen again. You're going to stay out of trouble. That's all you can think about as you cross the parking area, mount the wooden stairs, and walk along the veranda. There's a musty odor in the air. You set your suitcase down by the front door. The entrance hall is empty, silent except for the buzz of flies against the sun-drenched window. You make your way across the deserted dining room, past the battered upright piano and push open the swinging doors at the far end of the room. The short, gray-haired man at the sink turns, peers at you over his glasses, and then begins to wipe his hands on the soiled apron. Hi, young fella. Hi. Where will I find the boy? Oh, he'll be around. He uh, must be the new piano player. That's right, Danny Williams. Williams. Danny Williams. You never heard of me before. I'm Gus Peters. I do the cooking. Sit down, sit down. Thanks. He didn't make it to bus stop, huh? Who's he? Mr. Hedges? Hedges? No. Hmm. Uh, how about a cold beer? You look like you could use one. Got any milk? Milk? Say, you sure you're the piano player? I said I was. Ulcers? No ulcers. The cows need publicity. Yeah, okay. If that's what you want. Why didn't somebody meet me at the bus stop? A long hike out in this heat. Well, I can't drive for one thing. Never could learn how. Slade is still sleeping, I guess. He wouldn't go after you anyway. And the boss had other things to do. Mm. Must have outside interest. In business so much that keeps Mr. Hedges busy. It's keeping up with his wife that's got him going. His wife? Yep. Don't let her out of his sight much. Hey, you uh, want a sandwich or something? No, no, no. He doesn't trust you. He's yeah, jealous, you know. Thinks every man he talks to is going to take her away from him. How about a piece of pie? No, no, this one's good. Yeah. We sure have been having a fast turnover of piano players around here. They, uh, stay away from him. It's the, uh, the perfume, huh? Uh-huh. Yeah. <clears throat> Been only two men around here who ain't ever been bothered by Mrs. Hedges. Me and Andy Slade. 
You'll meet him. He works here in the bank. How does he manage to resist? Ain't never been able to figure it out. He's strictly business and a natural cold fish. Uh, you leave your stuff on the veranda, Danny? Yeah. I'll take it up. Your room's in the attic next to mine. Don't bother. No bother. Just going upstairs in a few minutes anyway. Take a little snooze. Any objection if I try the piano on for size? No, go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, uh, August. Uh, Danny. Yeah? Stay away from her, son. Just stand to your piano and you'll be all right. Yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> This is what you sell. Yep. Strictly music. You, uh, you play very well. Much better than the others. Thanks. Nice. I knew you would. I could tell by your hands. They're different. I bet you were a child prodigy. I was born a poor but honest peasant in the Bronx. My mother scrubbed floors so I could have piano lessons. She thought I'd become a concert pianist. It didn't work out. Don't cry. I just made that up. Who kicked you while you were down, music man? Look, Red. The story of Danny Williams is sort of dull. You wouldn't be interested. Now, why don't you go back to the lake? Very rude. Business is business, Mrs. Hedges. Oh. Oh. You know who I am? Yeah, the boss's wife. Period. And what does that mean? It means I need the job, and I don't like wives that are on the prowl. Oh. What a fast with your miss, aren't you, baby? Not Johnny Hedges, if that's what you're worried about. Relax, man. My name is Slade. Andy Slade. I got the gambling concession out back. Welcome to paradise. It's an unusual job, isn't it, Danny? One of the strangest you've ever had. You never bargained for this sort of thing when you first accepted it. Johnny Hedges' roadhouse at Mirror Lake didn't seem to suggest the danger and intrigue that suddenly presents themselves. Lucille and the way you met her on the boat dock. The warning from Gus. And now the coldly calculating gambler, Andy Slade, stands at your side with the strangest greeting you've ever received. I said, William, you're off to a great start. But here only and now, and the boss's wife slaps your face. Uh, political discussion, wasn't it? Yeah, you might call it that. Now, some dames get mad if you don't whistle at them. Anything else on your mind? No, nothing. Except the boss wants to see you. You've been up there in the office listening to you. He thinks you're good. And you don't? Well, I keep telling him he'd be better off with a jukebox. Nobody ever heard of a jukebox making a play for a dame. You, uh, know what I mean? I know what you mean. Just let me give you a tip. Save it. That's all I've been getting ever since I come here. Okay, okay. It's your funeral. But, uh, Hedges is getting a little sick and tired of hearing the wolf call. You said he thought... wanted to see me. Yeah. Up the stairs there on your right. Thanks. Oh, uh, William. Yeah? It's nice to have you with us. I think you'll get to like it here. That is, if you stay long enough. Come in, William. Come in. Your gambling concession said you wanted words. That's right. I just want to iron out a few things before you start. Now, you're an ex-con on parole. That's been ironed out the past three years to care of it. I'm here to play the piano, and that's all. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's all you're here for. Just remember that. Some of the others didn't. So I love music. Well, I'm glad to hear it, Williams. I'm glad to hear it. It'll save us both a lot of headaches. All right. Now, you'll play in the dining room from 8 till closing time. You take the breaks to suit yourself. Won't be a lot of people in the dining room. Sometimes there may not be any at all. I'm not fussy. And another thing you might as well know from the start. I don't make my money from the dining room. Not much on the bar either. I didn't think it did. I got a place fixed up in the back. Dice table, roulette wheel. Andy Slade runs that end of it. It's not going to affect you one way or the other. Sure. Well, that all? Yeah. Yeah, you, you met everyone, have you? Yeah, Slade and Gus the Cook. And my wife. You were talking to her down there on the pier a couple hours ago. Yeah. No one picked me up at the bus stop, so I had to walk. I was asking directions. Uh-huh. All right, Williams, just remember what I said. You stick to your piano play, and we're going to get along fine. If you get bored, let me know. I'll buy you a book. That night, you play for a half a dozen couples in the dining room. And more than once during the evening, your thoughts turn to Lucille. She means trouble, doesn't she, Danny? And you don't intend to have any. You're going to stay clear of her. You're going to play it safe with Johnny Hedge as her husband. You have no intention of winding up in the lake with a bullet in your head or back in a prison cell. In the nights that follow... You become accustomed to the habits of the paradise customs. Learn when to be on hand. When you can slip away for a quiet smoke or a chat with Gus. And then one night in the middle of the second week, you go out on the veranda and light up a cigarette. Hello, Danny. Oh, hello. You've done a good job these past ten days. Thanks. Of staying away from me, I mean. I get on quick. You don't know what it is to feel out of place. Over drives all by yourself. And just walks along the beach. You do that? Almost every night after the customers leave. The cove on the North Shore. Why? Oh, I don't know. Get away, I guess. From your husband? From myself, maybe. I don't know, Danny. I'm just confused sometimes. Yeah, I'd say so, too. Excuse me, will you? I gotta go confuse some customers. You leave her, Danny. Go back to your keyboard and the cocktail concerto. But somehow through the evening, the haze of music, the laughter in the smoke-filled room, the something that haunts you keeps drifting back like broken parts of an old refrain. Almost every night after the customers leave, cold on the North Shore. It stays with you, Danny, that night, and into the next until after you finish playing, unable to fight down the urge you... You find yourself slipping away, taking a rowboat and crossing the lower tip of the lake in the half-darkness. At the cove, you look around and there's no sign of her. You call yourself a fool and wonder why you came out here. When you promise yourself to stay out of trouble, you're about to, you're about to turn back when... Oh, oh yeah... You can step right out here. Yeah. I'll pull the boat up, boys. Yeah, it's better. I really don't know why I came. I'm glad you did, Dana. Glad to have somebody talk. But I don't want to get you into trouble. Any harm in just talking? He wouldn't think we were just talking. Forget about it, Phil. Sounds nice, really. You know, Danny... You're not as hard as you pretend. No? If you were, you wouldn't have rode way out of it. Danny. Yeah? Don't do it again. you lose your job. I'll lose the job and get a few hours. But he can cause you trouble. Danny, you've got to ignore me. Act as if I didn't exist. If it's any other way, you won't last here. Not at all. Is that why Slade lasted? Slade and I hated each other from the first. Johnny knows that. Anything nice guy, your husband. Charming as a meat ass. Please, Danny, I want you to understand this. Is, this is I'm going to avoid you. You sound like a magazine ad. Oh, Danny. 
Danny, why did you come here? Why? I don't know. I don't know. Boy Scout instinct, maybe. But there's nothing we can do. I can't lead and he'd follow me. Bring me back. Maybe you didn't want to come back. You don't know. You tell me, Danny. I know. Believe me, I know. Maybe. Maybe not. No way, Lucille. Give me a little time to think about it. It's in a tough spot. Maybe I can help you. I got a merit badge once for pathfinding. <laughs> When you leave her, Danny, and start the long row back across the lake, you remember a promise, one that you made to yourself about staying out of trouble. And you ask yourself if this is the way. When you arrive at the boat dock, you're convinced that it must end right here. And then going up the path toward the roadhouse, you pass a small cottage in back of the inn, and suddenly you're aware of voices arguing, and you stop to listen. You go over on the lake. You met some guy. Oh, don't leave. I just... Easy, son. Where are you going? Tess. Uh-huh, I've been waiting to warn you. Catch his nose. She met somebody. Good thing you didn't ride back with her in the car. Come on, Danny. Let's go back to the inn. Look, Gus, I Come got... on, Danny. Yeah. Yeah, I guess for a minute I had the crazy idea I should be butting in. You better stay clear of that setup, Danny. He's his wife. Not yours, you know. I just play the piano here, yeah, sure. That's what you get paid for. Okay, okay. Just forget everything else, son. Forget everything. Except that you're the guy who wants to stay out of trouble. If old Gus expected the passage of hours to make any difference, he was wrong, wasn't he, Dad? Even without seeing Lucille all that next day, you can't get her off your mind. The struggle within you goes on and following night as your hands move across the keyboard when you entertain the late dinner crowd. And then shortly after one in the morning, she comes in, moves quickly across the room. And as she goes past you at the piano, there's a quickly whispered message. I've got to see you, Danny, out back. Come as quickly as you can. You continue playing as if nothing happened. You've made up your mind, haven't you, Danny? You know it was a mistake meeting her at the cove. And you're not going to repeat that mistake, are you? Danny. Oh, see. Yeah, I had to see. Sure. Danny, I can't stand it any longer. Danny, someone's coming. Ah, uh, hello. Easy. I thought I told you to stick to your piano playing music, man. Leave us alone, Lucille. Go back inside. Danny, I'm Go on. Yeah, beat it, Lucille. Because right now I'm going to go to work on him. <laughs> As Johnny Hedges comes out of the darkness after you, there's a flash of a knife blade. You lunge for it. It's like a nightmare, isn't it, Danny? All out of focus, unreal. A strange, struggling sensation. There's the fleeting memory of the knife falling on the path. And then movement over which you have no control. Blows falling, exchanging, a dull thud. And then... Danny. Danny, you all right? I hit him, Gus. He met me and I hit him. With this, I know Drop it, Danny. Drop it. Come on, son. You've got to get out of here. No, wait. He's still alive, Danny. You've got to get away before No, it he... was self-defense. I can tell him that. They won't believe you. You're an ex con Doesn't and... make any difference. You can't leave me out of this, no matter what happens to me. I'm going to get him to a hospital. Come on, help me get him to his car. He's still alive. And I've got to try to keep him that way. <laughs> Somehow you manage to get him into his car. And through it all, you know that Gus is right. The trouble you wanted to escape, you're now inviting, asking for. But as you back the car onto the road with hedges in the seat beside you, all you can think of is saving him. And then suddenly you're aware of Lucille at the window of the car. Danny. Danny, what are you doing? I've got to get him to a hospital. He'll die oh, if I don't. Oh, Danny, they'll arrest you. They'll say you killed him. It was self-defense. They won't believe you. can't let you do it. Please, Danny, if you love me, you'll leave him here and get away. 
You do love me, don't you, Danny? I'm taking him to the hospital, Lucille. Danny! Danny, no! She leaps back as the car moves forward. You catch a fleeting glimpse of her face, white, drawn, concerned, and then it's gone, and you're aware of hedges beside you, breathing softly but steadily. And as your foot presses down on the accelerator, you realize that your own strength is fading fast. The struggle, Danny, the pounding you took, it's telling now as you fight to hold the car on the road. Moments later, a flash of light caught in the rearview mirror. It blurs your vision. In the haze, the fog that envelops your brain, you think you hear Lucille's voice. Her face seems to float close to you out of the darkness. Danny! Danny, let's give me stop the car! No, no, Lucille. Danny, the car, look out! Come around, Doc. Yes. He's going to be all right. I better call the lieutenant. You sit there with me. Lieutenant. Police. Take it easy, John. Yes. What's wrong with The hospital is over. You've been unconscious for over 12 hours. Hedges. What? What about Hedges? Hedges is dead. Trouble, Danny. You were headed for it the day you walked up the road to Paradise Inn. No matter how hard you struggled and tried to avoid it, it was there all around you, closing in. Because you couldn't stay with your music and leave Lucille alone. She couldn't help it either, could she, Danny? You're sure of that. But it doesn't matter now. Because instead of helping her, you've ruined everything. Her husband is dead and you'll be blamed, won't you, Danny? They'll never believe it was self-defense, not with your past record. You lie back on the white hospital bed. The doc will be bringing the police back in a minute. Yeah, yeah I know. Hedges. Well, this is it. I have to tell him, Gus. You don't have to tell him anything. You didn't kill him. You only knocked him out, Danny. He broke his neck in that car crash. You were crowded off the road, son. What? You sealed Hedges. She was trying to stop him. Lucille. Is she all right? No. She was killed, too. Oh. oh it was my fault, because she was in love with me. No, she I... wasn't. You played it straight. She didn't. She framed you, Danny. Set that meeting there behind the roadhouse with you, knowing her husband would find you together. What? She wanted you to kill him. Didn't care what happened to you. I don't believe it. Son, that's why she didn't want you to make it to the hospital. She wanted him dead. But Gus, I... It was so she could be free for the guy who was driving the car after you last night. He was killed with her. Oh. The one guy nobody figured. Uh, the only guy she was ever crazy about. Whistler has been a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you 
you do go farther with Signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with Signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood Signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, to rent danger. I am the Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. When in the editorial offices of the Cincinnati Gazette, the news was received that Killer Carter, the gang murderer, had escaped from the penitentiary in Columbus and that he had been at large for 24 hours. It was decided that Danny Pearson, star reporter, was to be sent up to the Capitol to cover the manhunt that was sure to follow. Danny borrowed a car from Clem Tracy, the rewrite man, and headed north late on Friday afternoon. Car trouble held him up, and at one o'clock he was still far from his destination. He was getting too sleepy to drive. So when he saw the tourist sign in front of the lonely farmhouse, he made his decision. He'd stop, get a few hours of sleep, and continue into Columbus in the early hours of morning. He pulled in the lane, parked the car, and went up onto the porch. It took a few moments to rouse anyone, but finally the door opened and there stood a woman. What do you want? Uh, good evening. I was driving along the road looking for a place to stay for the night, and I saw your tourist sign out front, so I thought I'd stop it. Why don't you drive on to the city? Well, I'm too tired to drive that distance tonight. I'm afraid I'd fall asleep at the wheel. You do have a room, don't you? I guess so. Cost you two dollars in advance. Well, that's all right. And I don't serve any meals here. Well, I'm not hungry. And I'll be leaving in the morning before breakfast. All right, come in. Uh, is it okay to leave my car in the driveway here? It'll be safe there. Nobody will steal it. Come in. She certainly isn't very friendly, Danny, is she? But a room is a room, and it'll be nice and quiet here for the night. The house is large and dingy and eerily quiet. Almost too quiet. Here it is. You'll find everything neat and clean. There's a bathroom to the right of the bed and plenty of towels and soap. Oh, thank you. Looks fine. Did you leave your luggage in the car? Uh, no, I don't have any luggage with me. I'm traveling light. Well, I... Guess anyone who drives an expensive car like yours can do anything he likes. <laughs> I'm going to bed myself right away, so if there's anything else you want, you'd better think of it now. Uh, well, thanks, but there's nothing else I need. Good night, Mrs. Good night. Oh, fine. Your hostess is hospitable, isn't she? But don't worry about it. People are sometimes like that on the farm. Not used to talking much. They prefer action because actions speak louder and longer than words. And the bed is soft and comfortable. That's the main thing. Just made for your night's rest. Who's there? I said, who's there? Oh, hello. Who are you? My name is Claire Monroe. Well, Claire, do you make a habit of walking into strange men's rooms in the middle of the night? I, I want to talk to you. Huh? What are you so nervous about? I'm afraid you'll find me in here. She? The lady who showed you the room. Well, why don't you leave? Because I have to talk with you. Okay, go ahead. Talk. I don't know where to start. Just tell me that you're lonesome. You don't have any excitement on the farm. You're looking for something to do. It's an old routine. It's nothing like that. I know you're going to think I'm crazy, but I've got to ask you. Will you take me away from the Me? 
Why should I? Because I have to get away from here. I never want to see this house again as long as I live. Why don't you just run away? You don't need me. Because I don't have a car and I don't have any money. My mother would have me picked up by the police. She'd tell them I wasn't of age. Well, are you? I'm 23 years old, but I can't prove it. Why not? Because I'm an adopted child and I don't know where I was born. And my mother... Call that lady my mother. She'd lie about my age just to keep me from going away. Well, how do I know you're of age? Look at me. Do I look 17? No, I'll have to admit you don't. I know I'm 23 years old, but she won't let me go. Well, why do you want to run away? Because... Because that lady, my foster mother, last night, she murdered my foster father. Whistler fans, we members of the cast certainly owe you a great big thanks tonight. In fact, two of them. Two weeks ago, you'll recall, we asked a favor of you. Asked if you'd be kind enough to drop in on the folks who are bringing you the Whistler your signal gasoline dealer, and tell him how you like this program. Well, since then, signal gasoline dealers all the way from Canada to Mexico have been telling us how many of you stopped at their stations and expressed enthusiasm for the Whistler. So, naturally, we of the cast are mighty happy and mighty grateful to you. Oh, but that's only the half of it. You see, during the past month, the popularity of the Whistler has continued to increase so much but now, according to the latest radio popularity survey, more people listen to The Whistler than to any other West Coast program. Yes, The Whistler is now way out in front. So, for your loyalty, thanks again to all of you from all of us. And now, back to The Whistler. Danny Pearson had driven up from Cincinnati looking for a murderer, but he hadn't expected to find one so soon, nor to find another one than the one he was looking for. But you never know what you'll find when you stop at a lonely farmhouse where they take in tourists, Danny. You lie there in your bed as a good-looking young girl asks your protection from her murdering foster mother. If this is a gag, it's a pretty rugged one. Let's break this up. I don't feel like playing games. i got to get some sleep. You don't believe me, but I'm telling you the truth. Ever since they adopted me, they've done nothing but fight with one another. You've seen my mother. You can tell how cold and strong she is. Well, my father was just as weak as she is strong. She bullied him for years, mostly because he didn't make a lot of money. All she cares about is money. And because we never had any, she hates everything and everybody, especially my father. But how do you know she killed him? Did you see it? No, she threatened more than once to kill him, though. Last night I was in bed and I heard a shot. I wasn't sure whether or not I dreamed it, so I didn't get up to see. But when I came down this morning, she said that he had left and wasn't coming back. That he'd gone out west somewhere. That didn't sound like him because he was born and brought up in this part of the country and he wouldn't leave it for anything. How in the world do you know he's dead? You know, in law, you have to produce a body. I haven't seen it, but I think I know where it is. Oh, where? Today I was walking out on the farm and I noticed a patch of ground up in the edge of the woods that was recently dug up. And when she saw me out there, she got very angry. Ordered me into the house. I'm positive she killed him and buried him there. Oh. What were you doing in this man's room? I was just, just talking to him, that's all. Up to your father's sex, weren't you? You're just like She him. was just talking to Stealing him. from the guests, sneaking in to rob them or worse. No, I only wanted to talk. He was just telling me about the shows and things in the city. Get back to your room and stay there. Get. If I catch you in here again, you'll wish your head stayed there. And as for you, young man, you'd better watch your step or you'll be in trouble. Oh, now, look. Wait till... <laughs> well, Danny, cozy little situation you step to it into, isn't it? A girl, pretty but strange who accuses her foster mother of being a murderess. Mrs. Monroe, in turn, accuses the daughter of being like her father, who evidently made a habit of robbing his tourist guests in their sleep. And how about that, Danny? She did speak into your room. Did she come to talk, uh, as she said? 
or to rob you. And what's it all about, anyway? Who can you believe? But there is one thing you know. You're going to get up, get dressed, and get out of this place as fast as you can. That drive into town doesn't look half as far now. But just as you're about to leave, you see something slip under your door. A piece of paper, a note. Go on, Danny. Pick it up and read it. Please, you've got to believe me. I need your help. My room's across the hall. Clear. Oh, no. That's right. Crumple it up and throw it away, Danny. But wait a minute. Suppose she is telling the truth. Suppose she is in danger. You couldn't go off and leave her like this. Especially not as pretty a girl as Claire. 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 Yes. It's me, Danny. Danny Pearson. Don't put on a light. Get dressed and come on with me. I am dressed. Oh, come on. Where are we going? You're going to show me where you think your father was buried. <laughs> So the two of you move cautiously out of the house into the darkness of the outside night. You pick up a shovel at the barn and start up the path through a field of sharp, tough hay. You keep looking over your shoulder, afraid that she might see you and come out of the house after you. Why should you be afraid of her? Well, if she killed a man once, she could do it again. Finally, you reach the woods and Claire points out the patch of ground she thinks her mother made into a graveyard. This is it, right here. I wish we could see a little better. We'll see too well, I'm afraid. The ground isn't very hard. The shovel sinks right into it. Told you it would. I hope the boss could see me now. Why I'm doing it, I'll never know. Maybe it's because you like me. Well, well, what makes you think that? Because you'd have run away. you have gone back to sleep after she took me away. Back to sleep. Hey, tell me. Is what she said about your foster father true? You mean about him stealing from the guest? Yes. She hounded him about money, so the final took her that to satisfy her. When tourists came, he'd wait till they were asleep and then slip in and rock them. Yeah, but didn't anybody ever catch him? Not that we ever knew of. He only took part of their money, not all of it. So they didn't miss it until they'd left. And then they had no proof. Sweet little racket. Maybe somebody caught on, and that's why he went out west. I don't think so. Because we didn't have any tourists here last night. At least not that I know of. It's possible, though, isn't it? You could have taken somebody in after you were asleep. Yes, possible. Then he might have tried to rob them. And they caught him, and he had to leave hurriedly. That could account for his disappearance. Yes, but... Hey, I just hit something. Oh, Danny. I got hold of it. Here it comes. Yeah. His coat. My father's coat. Yeah? Just when I had it figured out another way. Danny, don't dig anymore. I'm getting scared. I couldn't stand to look at it. Don't dig anymore. Just fill it in. We, we found out what we wanted to find out. Please fill it in. Take it easy, baby. I don't like this any more than you do. I'm just doing it because you wanted me to. I couldn't bear to look at it. Don't dig anymore. Okay, I'll fill it in. I guess we've seen enough to know you were right. So you put the coat back where you found it, Danny, and fill in the hole again. You pat the dirt down again, just as you found it, and start back for the house. On the way back to the house, Claire holds your arm tightly, and you notice for the first time how soft and warm she is. Of course, she's trembling a little bit, but who wouldn't? Danny, will you promise to take me away tomorrow? I couldn't stand another night here. Where would I take you? What would I do with you when I got you there? I, I, I got enough to do without taking care of somebody else. Take me to some place far away, some city. I'll get a job and take care of myself. Don't worry about that. Just get me away from here. Your mother might accuse me of kidnapping. <laughs> Once she knew I was never coming back, I don't think she'd even care. Please, Danny, don't let me stay here. I'm afraid. She might even do something to me if she finds out I know what happened. You've got to help me. All right, all right. 
I'm a sucker, but I'll do it. But remember this. Once I get you out of here, you're strictly on your own. I got enough things to worry about without trying to take care of you. Oh, thank you, Danny. Thank you. Mm. We'll leave the first thing in the morning. No, we'll leave tonight, right now. That's awfully sad. Well, you wanted to get out of here, didn't you? I'm leaving right now. You can do what you want. Come or stay. I'll go with you. Yeah, we're almost at the house. Don't even bother to go inside and get anything. She might hear you. Here, here's my car. We'll just jump in and beat it. You game? Yes. All right, now be quiet. We'll get in the car and let it roll backwards into the road. Just a minute. Surprise? You didn't think I'd let you get away, did you? Hey, put that shotgun down. It might go off. It might if you start anything. Allison, here, Mrs. Monroe. You thought I was asleep, didn't you? I had better sense. I watched you leave the house together, and I had a pretty good idea you weren't coming back. So what? What do you think you're doing with that gun? Maybe I'm protecting my daughter from a fast-talking stranger. I can take care of myself. That remains to be seen. And as for you, young man, I want you to get back in your car, drive off, and never come around here again. That's a very good idea. I'll buy that. Should have left here a long time ago. I'm going with him. You stay where you are. I'm old enough to do what I want to do. I'm going to leave, and you can't stop me. You don't think so? You wouldn't dare pull that trigger. Put your foot on that running board and try me. Hey, now, look, girl. You There's keep no... out of this. Maybe I'm doing this as much to protect you from her. I don't need any Wait. protection. Wait. Wait. Somebody's coming. The car. Yeah. Hey, looks like they're turning into your lane. Both of you get in the car. Quick. Keep your lights out. Drive us in the barn. Throw him more of this pair and shut the door after you. Pardon me, ma'am. Yes? I'm a police officer. What can I do for you? We're chasing a man. We think he came up this way. You seen any strangers around lately? Uh, what did he do? He escaped from the state penitentiary. Is he dangerous? He's a cold-blooded murderer. He escaped yesterday, and we've cracked him down to this vicinity. He's been driving stolen cars. Last we heard, he was driving a big, rich-looking convertible he picked up in Columbus. Have you seen him? No. Nobody stopped here. Didn't even see anybody passing the road. No. Well, he's in this neighborhood somewhere. But, say, didn't you know about this before? I mean, I thought you did when I saw you with your shotgun here. Oh. Oh, no, I... I just saw you coming up the lane. and I like to be prepared for strangers this time of night. <laughs> yeah, sure. It is pretty late. You ought to be in bed. I don't let this keep you up. You needn't worry about Carter. We'll get him. I won't worry. Oh, that's fun. Say, what are those tire tracks on the ground? Where? There, where my flashlight's pointing. They go toward the barn. Those are tractor tire marks. Oh. Well, I'm sorry that I bothered you, ma'am, but, well, we've got a job to do. That's all right, mister. I could have helped you some. We'll keep looking. Good night, ma'am. Okay, Al, let's go. Too bad you couldn't hear what was being said, Danny, waiting in the barn. But while the lady and the officer were talking, you had some things to say to Claire. What are we going to do now? Nothing. Just wait. You see who that is out there? A man got out of a car and he's talking to us. Do you know who he is? Nobody's got a flashlight. Wait a minute. Something on his coat lapel flashes. I think it's a bag. It must be the police. What are we going to do? I told you, nothing. Murder is a matter of proof. So we can prove that your mother murdered your father, we don't have a leg to stand on. Anyway, I told you I don't want to get mixed up in it. I, I've got enough to worry about myself. It's all right with me. All I want to do is get out of here. Okay. Just figure some way to get that gun away from your mother. Danny, the men are leaving. Driving down to the road. She's coming back to the barn. All right, just sit tight. Wait. They're gone. Well, so they're gone. I suppose you're breathing easier now. Maybe I am, and maybe I'm not. Will you stop pointing that gun at us? I will when I've finished what I'm going to do. You won't get away with shooting anybody. You ought to know. I don't intend to stand here talking all night. Well, here's what I want you to do. 
Want the both of you to get in that car and drive to Kingdom Come if you can. Never want to see either one of you again as long as I live. You changed your mind. Oh, that suits me. Come on, Danny, let's get out of here while we've got the chance. Heaven knows what she might do. Okay, let's go. Just a minute. What? Before you go, Claire, I think there's something you ought to know about your fine new friend. I know all I want to know about him. Do you know what he really is? He's a murderer. A mur he escaped from the state prison yesterday, and the police are looking for him. They'll get him sooner or later. They always do. What do you think of that? I don't believe it. And even if it were true, I, I don't care. Where did you pick up this routine about me being a murderer? Don't listen to her, Danny. I believe you. What if I was a murderer? It wouldn't make the slightest difference in the world to me. Because, Danny, I'm in love with you. Do you know what you're saying? Yes, I know what I'm saying. Come on, let's get out of here. She gives me the jitters. Don't I, though? Okay, if that's the way everybody wants it, we'll go. I don't know what we'll do, but we'll figure out something. You better think hard. Hurry up, then. Yes, hurry up. You'll get caught quicker that way. All right, everybody stand where you are. Oh. Put that gun down, lady. Andy? Yeah? You and I'll go around the other side of the barn. All three of you stand over there. Dave, see if they have any guns. No guns on that one. Uh, no guns, Sheriff. No guns, eh? Good. Now, don't misunderstand me. There might not be anything wrong here, but I had to come back and take a look. Pretty unusual for a woman to be walking around outside at 2 o'clock in the morning with a shotgun. Now, out with it. What's going on? What are you hiding in the barn for? Who's this car belong to? Come on, start talking to somebody. Here's the murderer you're looking for. There he is, and there's the car. Why didn't you tell me that when I was here before? Because I thought there might be a reward for him, and I wanted to collect it myself. She didn't, because she was going to let him get away. Who are you? My daughter, Claire Monroe. All right. Now, who are you? Danny Pearson. Do you have to use that light? Keep yeah. him covered, Dave. What are you doing here? Stopped here for the night. They rent room. Tourists. I don't recommend it. Where do you live? Cincinnati. What do you do for a living? Newspaper reporter. I was on my way here to cover the car to break. Here's my press card. Well, let's see. Mm -hmm. Daniel J. Pearson, Cincinnati Gazette. How are you? All right, take it back. Where'd you get this car? I borrowed it from another reporter in Cincinnati. Okay. I told you he was the man you're looking for. Don't let him fool you with a good story. He's not fooling us, lady. He's not the man we're looking for. The guy we want is at least 45 years old. This fellow isn't even 30 yet. Well, I guess I made a mistake all around. Just a man. Sheriff, you're looking for a murderer? I'm always looking for a murderer. All right, then. Go ahead, Claire. Tell him. What? Well, Danny, I... Go ahead. Has to come out sooner or later. Come on, young lady. If there's anything to tell, let's have it. Well... Well, that woman, my foster mother, murdered my father. What? Are you crazy? No. No, last night I heard a shot. And then this morning when I came down, she said he'd gone away. Out west. And he wouldn't do that. He wouldn't... But he did. I found the note he left on the old typewriter in the hall when I came down this morning. Hmm. Did you hear the shot, too? I... I don't know. I thought I dreamed it. She heard it all right. She killed him. Danny and I just found the body buried up in the woods. What? Oh, no. No. All right. Keep her covered, Al. Wait a minute, officer. If this woman had murdered her husband, why did she take the chance of giving me a room tonight? Knowing that I might learn something. Why wouldn't she have run away? Or killed the girl, too, to cover up? But Danny... On the other hand, Claire here never once mentioned going to the police about the murder. She was willing to run away with me a few minutes ago. Even though she thought I was a murderer. And she knew exactly where the body was buried. She could have written the note to her mother. Danny. Danny, you mean you think I... Yes, I do. Officer, this is the woman you want. She murdered her foster father. <laughs> Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's tale. Meantime, because yesterday marked the opening of a six-week's drive to check auto brakes, 
sponsored by the International Association of Chiefs of Police. Signal Oil Company believes you'll want full information on just what this drive means to you. With today's cars averaging seven years old, faulty brakes are threatening to increase America's already large number of traffic accidents, which kill over 20,000 men, women, and children per year, injure another 800,000, and cost a billion and a quarter dollars. What's more, when a car is damaged or wrecked in an accident today, parts are often not available to repair it, and there are no new cars to replace it. So it means an even further strain on the transportation America must have to see us through the war. That's why traffic officers in every state plan to check every car involved in a moving traffic violation or accident. So the time to have the safety of your brakes checked by a competent brake expert is now. Your cooperation in this brake drive may prevent an accident that could cost you your car or your life. And now, back to the whistler. Well, Danny turned out to be quite a detective, didn't he? He saw through Claire all the time and figured the whole thing out. But wait, did he? Well, not exactly. Because, you see, when they dug up the grave at the edge of the woods, they found Mr. Monroe's clothes, but the body was someone else's. In fact, when the police identified it, it was the body of Killer Carter. Yes, Killer Carter escaped convict. And when they'd put out a dragnet and caught up with Claire's very much alive foster father, they got the whole story. Danny had figured it exactly right once. Killer Carter had stopped at the tourist home late that night. Neither Claire nor her foster mother knew about it. When the old man started to pull his usual robbery, Carter caught him. In the struggle, Carter was shot and killed in self-defense. But not knowing who his victim was, Mr. Monroe got scared, buried him after changing clothes with him, wrote the note to his wife, and took off in Carter's stolen car. Knowing nothing of Carter's presence in the house, Claire had suspected her mother, and Mrs. Monroe had suspected Claire of murdering a man who wasn't dead and was a fugitive from a crime that wasn't a crime in the police book. The killing of an escaped convict in self-defense. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal, Gasoline, and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, directed by George W. Allen with story by John Hayes, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting you let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Let every go signal remind you that you do go farther with signal gasoline. The Signal Oil Program. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, Death Sees Double. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Presently I'll tell you of nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. But first, Signal Oil Company is happy to devote this time to an announcement from the United States government on today's most important event. The opening of the Sixth War Loan Drive. Many Americans, unfortunately, won't be hearing this announcement beside their home radios tonight. Some are crouching in rain-filled foxholes in the Philippines or Burma. Others are slogging through cold and mud in northern Italy or in France, plagued by the new German stratosphere bomb. But they're not complaining. They're just asking for the weapons they need to get the fighting over and get them home again as soon as possible. That's where you come in. It's going to take more B-29s, lots more, at $600,000 each, and M-4 tanks at $67,000 each. Yes, millions and millions more dollars. But you're not being asked to give your dollars. Just invest them in the world's safest investment, a United States war bond. Make it a $100 bond this time. Your war bond dollars not only pay you excellent interest while ensuring your future security... But they say to the boys we sent over there, you're not quitting, neither am I, till it's over, over there. And now, the Whistler. You've heard of identical twins, haven't you? Yes. You don't run across them very often, but once in a while you'll find two people who look so much alike that even their own parents can't tell them apart. And that can lead to all sorts of complications. There's one case I have in mind especially. The case of Mona and Martha Spencer, identical twin sisters. They were exactly alike. Their friends couldn't tell them apart. Their mother and father, before they died, had trouble distinguishing between them. After their parents' death, they were alone in the world. Two devoted, loving sisters. At least that's what everyone thought. Two loving sisters, beautiful, popular, surrounded by admirers. Then, along came Bill Everett, handsome, successful, the catch of the season, as they say. And uh, Mona caught him. Yes, they became engaged, and Mona bought out the stores for her trousseau. And one night, she and Martha stood in Mona's room, admiring the beautiful dresses and lingerie she had purchased. And this dress, and this robe, and... It... What's the matter, Martha? Hmm? Oh, nothing. I think they're beautiful, all of them. Especially this dress. I wonder how I'd look in it. Well, you'd look lovely, dear, the same as I will. Why don't you try it on? Mm-hmm. Well, of course. It'll be like looking in a mirror as myself. Go ahead. I'd like to see how it will look on me. If you're sure you don't mind. Of course I don't mind. Go ahead. Try it on. Oh, you're a very lucky girl, Mona. Lucky? Be so lovely. You have Bill. Well, if I'm lovely, so are you. We're both alike. Yes, except for one thing. But, Martha, what is it? We've never had secrets from each other. How aren't we alike? You have Bill. Oh, I do believe you're jealous. Are you in love with Bill, too? Nonsense. I just can't help being a little jealous, naturally. You, you found your man, and... And I... Well, you blame me. We're not alike in another respect, Martha. You're weak and I'm strong. Weak? Yes. I found my man, as you put it, because I made up my mind to find. You should do the same. Darling, what's happened to all your boyfriends? You've been staying home so much lately. 
Well, I... I just haven't felt like going out, that's all. Martha, sometimes I don't understand you. You're so moody lately. Oh, oh, that's probably Bill. Run down and let him in like a good girl. I'll be dressed in a minute. All right. Oh, wearing your new dress, huh? Oh, yes, but oh, I... Oh, it's, it's beautiful. Well, get your coat. We're late. Oh, but, Bill, I... Oh, I'm sorry. I I forgot. Oh, rude. Well, that's hardly the way to kiss a sister. Huh? Oh. I've been trying to tell you, Bill. I'm Martha. Bill can't tell his fiance from her sister. Yes. It's too bad that incident at the door had to happen because it gave Martha an idea. She tried to put it out of her mind, but she couldn't. She thought about it all evening while Mona and Bill were out having a good time. Tell me from Mona. Couldn't tell me from Mona. Not even when he kissed me. He couldn't tell. Yes, that little voice kept whispering to her over and over and over again. It wouldn't go away. A thought was there, insistent, growing. If even Bill couldn't distinguish between them, why not? Why not? By the time Mona came home, the thought had grown into a plan, and Martha was waiting for her sister. Oh, hello, Martha. Still up? Yes, I... I couldn't sleep. Oh, what's the matter? I've been thinking. Really? Oh, that's good. Oh, now run along to bed like a good girl. I'm dreadfully tired. Suppose you've had a good time with Bill tonight. Wonderful. Where did you go? To the 74 Club and Maisie's and... Oh, I'll tell you all about it tomorrow. Tell me now. Martha, what's the matter with you? Why are you still up? It's late. You should have been in bed long ago. I couldn't sleep. Well, that's too bad, dear. Why not take something? I was thinking, I... I didn't want to sleep. Well, that's a waste of time. Now run along and get to bed. I'm certainly not going to stay and talk just because you don't want to go to bed. I'll tell you all about tonight in the morning, dear. Mona goes on about the absorbing business of getting ready for bed. But Martha stays in her room, sitting, watching her. And through her mind go the details of the plan, carefully, minutely... She watches her sister's beauty preparations with a stoic look on her face, but with hatred burning and growing inside her. Then Mona is ready. She climbs into bed and prepares to turn out the light. Run along, Martha. I'm going to bed. I want to talk. I told you we'd talk in the morning. No, we won't. What? There isn't going to be any tomorrow for you, Mona. What do you mean? What are you trying to do, scare me? I remember when we were little girls, you used to try to scare me. We're not children anymore, Martha. No, we're not, are we? But one thing is still the same. You always get the best of everything. That's the same. I've hated you for years, never really known it until now. Hated having a sister. A sister who always got the best of everything. And then Bill came along. So I was right. You are in love with Bill. Yes, Mona, I'm in love with Bill. You were right about another thing. I'm jealous of you. You're just lucky. You always have been lucky. You met him first, so he fell in love with you. Why couldn't it have been me? If I'd met him first, he would have fallen in love with me. <laughs> yes, you're laughing at me now, but you won't laugh much longer. You were right about several things, Mona, but you were terribly wrong about one thing. You said, I'm weak and you're strong. Well, you were wrong, Mona. I'm not weak. I'm strong. I'm stronger than you. I'm strong enough to kill you. You're a fool. You wouldn't gain anything by killing me. Wouldn't I? Now, stop this nonsense and go to bed. We'll talk about it in the morning when you're more calm. You don't believe me, do you, Mona? You don't believe there isn't going to be any morning for you. But it's true, Mona. You're going to die tonight. I'm going to kill you. Martha! Where did you get that gun? Gun? Why don't you remember, Mona? This was Father's gun. Put that down! You can't order me around any longer. I thought it all up. Get away from me! Martha! Clumsy, Aunt Mona. You can't run away from me. Martha! No! No! 
I'm following you, Mona. You won't go far. Just to the top of the stairs. Then you'll be down on your knees, begging me not to kill you. But it won't do you any good. Oh, in heaven's name! You see, it's you who's weak, not me. I'm strong. Arthur, no. You're making a mistake. It won't do you any good. Arthur, wait, please. Listen to me. See, Mona, I told you you'd be begging on your knees. You must listen. No. You listen. You don't think I'll gain anything by killing you. You think I'll be caught and convicted and die. Well, you're wrong again, Mona. I won't be caught and I won't die. No one will even know you're dead, Mona, because after I kill you, I'm going to become you. They'll think I died. They'll think I committed suicide. Mona, please! Perfect, Mona. Perfect in every respect. Isn't it lucky we're twins? How fortunate we look exactly alike. How fortunate we sound exactly alike. You are me now, Mona. And you're going to kill yourself. No! Arthur, don't! No! Arthur, no! No! Hold no. 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 Struggle. Won't do you any good. I'm strong, Mona. I'm strong enough to put this gun to your head. It must look like suicide, Mona. The gun. Close. Powder burns on your face. Hold still, Mona, while I... While I pull the trigger! <laughs> <laughs> Martha Spencer killed her twin sister, Mona. Then, carrying out her plan, she immediately assumed Mona's identity. She changed into Mona's dress, arranged the gun in Mona's hand, took Mona's engagement ring and diamond clip, dressed Mona in one of her robes and put her dinner ring on Mona's finger. Oh, yes, it was perfect. Perfect in every detail. What could the police suspect when not even Bill Everett could tell Mona and Martha apart? Hello? Police department? I think you better come to 437 Oak Street right away. My sister just committed suicide. What? Oh, yes, I... I'm... Mona Spencer. Yes, it's done now. Now there's no turning back, Martha. So don't get nervous. Keep calm and face the police just as if it really had been suicide. Nothing is going to go wrong, nothing. Not if you keep your head. Your plan is perfect. When the police arrive, you do keep your head. They ask only a few simple questions. And Bill, who arrives soon after, is with you to keep you steady. So you carry it off rather well. I subject you to these questions, Miss Spencer. I know how you must feel. Poor Martha. She threatened to kill herself, but I... I didn't think she'd do it. Had uh, she been depressed recently? Oh, yes, very depressed. She seemed to be losing control of herself. She was never quite the same after our parents died. Do you suppose your forthcoming marriage had anything to do with it? Well, I, I'm afraid it did. You see, Martha and I were always very close to each other. She, um, she had no boyfriend. I couldn't understand it. She was very attractive. Yes, just as you are. Um, uh, yes. But for some reason, no one ever became seriously interested in her. And then when Bill and I... Yes, I understand. By the way, Mr. Everett, did Martha Spencer say anything to you that might lead you to believe she contemplated suicide? Well, I... No, I can't say she did. It's all right, dear. You needn't spare me. I'm sure you must have noticed how strangely she'd been acting lately. Well, come to think of it, she didn't quite seem to be herself. Hmm. I see. Well, I don't think we need to trouble you any further, Miss Spencer. These were just routine questions. The coroner's verdict was suicide. I'm satisfied. Then if you'll excuse me. Of course. I'll be running along. Oh, don't bother to show me out. I can find my way. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, and good luck. Well, Mona, I uh, think I better be running along, too. I'll uh, I'll call you in the morning, huh? How much to go, Bill? I don't want to be alone for a while. Oh, yes, I know, but... Well, see here, Mona, I, I, I thought perhaps in view of what's happened, you... Uh, well, you might want to postpone our marriage for a while. Oh, nonsense, Bill. I feel badly about poor Mark, of course. But we can't help her now. We, we may as well forget it and enjoy our own happiness. As you wish. Bill. Yeah? You, uh... You haven't kissed me since Martha died. Oh. Sorry. <sighs> I love you, Bill. 
now you're mine. Forever. You are listening to The Whistler, brought to you by your friend, the Signal Oil Company, marketers of famous Signal Gasoline, your best buy today. Remember to let every go signal remind you that you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Well, several weeks went by. Martha thought she'd better wait a little while to make certain that the cold-blooded murder of her sister was not suspected. Yes, she was a clever girl, this Martha Spencer, posing as her twin sister, Mona. Martha knew she looked exactly like Mona. But did she talk exactly like her and walk and act and make love exactly like Mona? At first, the possibility bothered her. Bill, kiss me. Hmm? Okay. There. Bill. Yeah? You sometimes act so cold. I haven't done anything to make you feel different. You know better than that. What's eating you, Mona? Nothing, nothing. Only I just wondered if, if I'd changed any. So much has happened. No, you haven't changed, Mona. You'll never change. Never in this world. Yes, everything was going all right. Bill didn't suspect a thing, neither did the police. And after a few weeks, Martha felt secure. Bill didn't act as she had expected him to act. There was a sort of a chilly detachment in his attitude toward her. But perhaps that was only because he was shy or reticent to show his feelings before they were married. So the thing to do was to hurry up the marriage. Bill, why should we wait? Why don't we go ahead and get married? Right away. Hmm? Okay, I, I suppose we might as well get it over with. That's a fine way to talk about our marriage. Okay, okay so we'll get married. We'll drive out to Raleigh tomorrow and get the license. Raleigh? Yes. Why drive way out to a little town like that to get it? You know why as well as I do. Oh, oh yes, I... Of course, dear, anything you say. <laughs> That's strange, isn't it, Martha? You don't know what he meant by that, do you? There must be some secret between Mona and Bill that you didn't know about. But never mind, it can't be very important. And he didn't suspect you. Don't worry about it as you drive out to Raleigh. Go to the courthouse and sign the application. But now there's something else. You watch amazed as Bill signs the application for a license. Bill? It's all right. I've signed correctly. Look, you can see for yourself. Bill, I... Stop it, Mona. What's getting into you? Next, please. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, here you are. Uh-huh. Let's see now. Seems to be all right. I'll be two dollars, please. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I'll have to wait three days, you know. <laughs> oh, well. Better wait a moment now than later in a divorce court. <laughs> Let's see. Let me check these names here again. Miss Mona Spencer and Mr. George Garrett. <laughs> There was something wrong, something terribly wrong. Why did Bill sign the license, George Garrett? A cold chill clutched at Martha's heart, but she didn't say anything to him. On the way home, he suggested that they celebrate the occasion by going out that evening to a little roadhouse up in the mountains. She accepted, of course, and told him she'd be ready at seven. She left his car and went up the steps of her home. Yes, her home now, all hers. She opened the front door. And as she closed it, something on the stairs caught her attention. Oh, oh! She looked at the top of the stairs. There was nothing there. She shrugged her shoulders and walked up. Just her imagination. Or was it? She paused at the top and looked at the rug. This was where she had killed Mona. She could almost see her, hear her. Martha, no! You're making a mistake! It won't do you any good! Stop it, Martha. You're beginning to hear things. 
She went to her room, Mona's room. Ah, it was good to be alone, to enjoy Mona's trousseau. All those wonderful things. She slid open the closet door. Ah, such beautiful dresses. Which one should she wear tonight? She tried to concentrate, sat down at the mirror, and there was her reflection. Mona's reflection. <laughs> oh, now isn't that a shame? Breaking that beautiful mirror and that fine bottle of perfume. She got up and paced the floor. She simply couldn't get it out of her mind. Why? Why? Why did Bill sign his name George Garrett? And why do Mona's words keep coming back to her? You're making a mistake. It won't do you any good. Martha, wait. Listen to me. I won't think about it. I won't. I won't. I won't. That's right, Martha. Don't think about it. Get dressed. Make yourself beautiful. As beautiful as Mona was. You should be happy tonight, Martha. In just three days, you'll be married to Bill. That's what you wanted, wasn't it? Well, then, be happy. Enjoy yourself tonight with Bill. Bill? Yeah? What's the matter? Matter? Nothing. Why? You've been so quiet. You've hardly spoken a word since we started. Oh, sorry. Beautiful night, isn't it? That's no good, Bill. Something's wrong. What is it? Now, look, Mona, I don't remember that part of the bargain was catering to your whims. Bargain? Oh, never mind. Bill, there's something I don't understand. Yeah, what? About the name you signed on the marriage license. It's okay, I told you once. I signed my right name. You're right. You saw it yourself. For heaven's sake, Mona, will you cut it out? Yes, of course, Bill. I'm sorry. Sorry? <laughs> That's a hot one. Bill. Yeah? You don't love me, do you? Oh, why go into that? Because I want to know. Okay. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Do you have to keep hammering at me? I'm sorry, Bill. Please don't shout at me. Bill. Well, what is it now? Where are we going? I told you once, to a little roadhouse. Well, I... I don't seem to recognize this road. Where are we? Oh, we're up in the mountains. We'll be at the top soon. Bill. You have to talk, Mona. Aren't you satisfied? You've had your own way. What more do you want? I want to know why you don't love me. I do love you. I'm crazy about you. Now leave me alone, will you? I'm not a fool, Bill. I want the truth. Well, you do. Well, just be patient, Mona. We're almost there. Almost where? At the top. Yeah. Just around this curve. There. We're here. I, I don't see any roadhouse. No, there isn't any more. Then why are we stopping? So you can get the truth. You're always getting everything you want. All right, Mona, look over there. Where? Over there, while I... Don't... Bill! Bill, what are you doing? I'm just tying your arms. Don't... And now I'm gagging you. Oh, oh, why are you doing that? There we are. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. Neat. oh. How does it feel to be gagged, Mona? Oh, oh, oh no, Mona, it's no use. That? You're going to listen to me now. You had your own way long enough. Always talking, always ordering, demanding. Well, I'm not going to go through with it, Mona. I'm not going to marry you. You can only torture a man so long and then he does something about it. I'm going to do something about it right now. Yes, Mona. Yes, I'm going to kill you. I tried to reason with you. I begged, I pleaded, I threatened, but you've only laughed at me. You thought because you knew my secret, you could force me to marry you. Well, you can't. I'd rather go to prison than marry you. No, I won't marry you. And I won't go to prison because... This is going to look like an accident. I've got a perfect alibi, Mona. I can count for every minute of this evening. When they find you, they'll think you took that curve too fast and they'll pronounce it accidental death. Perfect. This is your car and there's nothing to connect me with even being here this evening. I'll be rid of you, Mona. I'll be free to marry Lois. Oh, you didn't know Lois, did you? <laughs> you didn't even know such a person existed, did you? Well, she does. And I'm in love with her. I love her, not you. And I'm going to marry her. Please, Do please, you please. any good to beg for her? I can't trust you. I trusted you once with a secret, and you tried to blackmail me. Blackmail me into marrying you. I can't let you go over the cliff. Bound and gagged. No. No, that was just to make you listen so I could tell you why you're going to die. Wouldn't do to have them find you with your arms tied together. That wouldn't look quite like an accident, would it? Well, this is it, Mona. Now, you won't feel a thing when I bruise your pretty little head. Now, remove the gag. The rope. The brake. Okay, the clutch. Stop the engine. Uh, 
<laughs> Goodbye, Mona. Pleasant dream. Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, let's test your memory. How long has it been since you had the lubricant changed in your transmission and differential? That's an important question, because the tremendous pressure under which the gears in most modern cars operate gradually pulverizes tiny metal particles and turns even the best lubricants into a grinding, harmful abrasive. That's why, if it's been 5,000 miles or over six months, since you had your transmission and differential lubricant changed, your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer suggests that now is a good time to do it. Now, when you bring your car in to have its signal safety chart lubricated for winter protection. Your signal dealer has the equipment to thoroughly flush out the old, worn-out lubricant. And his signal safety chart shows the exact type of scientific high-pressure gear lubricant prescribed by the maker of your car. It's just another part of your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer's complete conscientious service to help your car go farther. And now, back to the whistler. Poor William Everett, or George Garrett. That was his real name. He didn't get away with it. His alibi was foolproof enough so far as the accident was concerned. But he forgot that Inspector Dudley would check up on the marriage license and see his name signed big as life. The name of George Garrett, an escaped convict. Yes, Inspector Dudley didn't have to pin a murder on him. All he had to do was send him back to prison to finish serving a term of life imprisonment. Poor Bill. He only committed murder to protect his secrets. And he never knew that it wasn't Mona he killed. It was Martha. And Martha hadn't the slightest idea that he had a secret. So she would never have given him away. Too bad Martha couldn't have known the truth before she killed Mona. Oh, well. That's what happens sometimes when you're a twin. And you're in love with the same man as your sister. Monday at 9 o'clock, the Signal Oil Program will bring you another strange tale by the Whistler. The Signal Oil Program is broadcast for your entertainment by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal's famous Go Farther gasoline and motor oil, and by your neighborhood Signal Oil dealer, who is at your service daily to keep your car running for the duration. The Signal Oil Program, produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Ralph Rose and music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Bob Anderson speaking for your friend, the Signal Oil Company, and suggesting once again that you let every go signal remind you that you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Sunday night, and CBS presents The Whistler. I, The Whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. And so I tell you tonight the amazing story of Mind Over Matter. Do you believe there is such a thing as sixth sense? That mind reading is possible? Many people believe that nothing enters the mind except by way of the five senses, but I know better. I know there is such a thing as telepathy. Else how would I know the things that I know? 
Yes, and Herbert Randall knows too. He believes because he's a student of parapsychology. Herbert is highly attuned to extrasensory perception. He believes that a person can learn things without the use of the five physical senses. At the moment, Herbert Randall, a textbook in his lap, is apparently dozing. His young wife, Andrea, reads a magazine in the opposite corner of the room. Herbert is mumbling to himself. Yes. Yes, I understand. I see you. I hear you. My unfinished manuscript, you must find it. I am Thomas Banning. You must get the manuscript. I am Thomas Banning, my manuscript. The title is Mind Over Matter. You must come to me. You must come. You must... Herbert. Thomas Banning. I see you. I'll find it. I'll come. Herbert. Huh? Please. What? Mumbling about. Oh, Andrea. You've been dreaming, mumbling to yourself. I haven't been asleep. I've been wide awake. I saw him. I heard him. You were dreaming. No, not for an instant. Thomas Banning, manuscript. That's what you've been mumbling. Who's Thomas Banning? Oh, he, he was a writer of books on psychic phenomena. I've never met him, never seen him until tonight. In a dream? No, no, it wasn't a dream. I wasn't asleep. And the message was too clear. Thomas Banning was trying, is trying to reach me. And he did. Still in the dream. Oh, dream or not, it was real. I've never met the man, never seen him. How could I dream about someone I'd never seen? I've got to locate Thomas Banning. Well, why? He has an unfinished manuscript, and he wants me to have it. Well, maybe he's dead. Not necessarily. This is no spook stuff. This is a case of a living mind trying to contact me. Oh, but why you, Herbert? You said you don't even know him. That doesn't matter. He must know of me. Thomas Banning. Unfinished manuscript entitled Mind Over Matter. Well, how can you find him, especially if you don't know what he looks like? I saw him, I heard him, and I'll find him. How? Through his publisher. He's written several books. I'll find him tomorrow. So Herbert learns the name of the publisher of Thomas Banning's books. Learns Banning's address in the country. And with Andrea drives to the place. As they near the estate, they stop at a gas station for further direction. Howdy, folks. What can I do for you? Uh, we're looking for the Thomas Banning home. Know where it is? Yep, I sure do. Why? Uh, we're going there. Well, it's a quarter of a mile ahead. First gate in the left-hand side. But not many people go there anymore. Why not? Well, miss, since the day Thomas Manning's brother disappeared, there's been strange things going on there. Oh, what strange things? Noises. Weird howls and screams. People kind of think the place is haunted with William Banning's ghost. William was Thomas's brother. Oh, is William dead? Oh, nobody knows what happens to William. Just blew in from South America and a few months later disappeared. Uh, have you heard the screams? Yeah, and what's more, I don't want even to talk about it. So long, folks. First gate in the left. Well, this really begins to sound interesting. <laughs> Yes? What is it? Is Thomas Banning in? What did you want? Who are you? Why, I'm Herbert Randall for Gregory House Publishers. Well? We we publish Mr. Banning's works. Oh, well, this is my assistant, Miss Adams. I see. Wait here a moment. Oh, bit of an icicle, isn't she? I don't like it, Herbert. Let's go. No. Thomas Banning is trying to direct me to do something, and I'm going to follow through. My uncle will see you in the library. This way. This is Mr. Randall, and this is Miss Adams. They're from your publisher. Oh, well, come in. Sit down. Uh, this is my nephew, Bart. Well, how do you do? How do you do? What did you want to see my uncle about? Why, I, uh, well, I, I'd like to talk to him about that. Uh, what was it you wanted, Mr. Randall? You're quite free to speak in front of us, Mr. Randall. I attend to all his business. Don't I, Uncle Thomas? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, of course, Bart. Uh, what was it you wanted? Well, I, I'd rather talk to you alone, Mr. Banning. <laughs> Come now. If it's about the publishing business, there should be no secret about that. No. Uh, this is your nephew, Mr. Banning? Yes, uh, of course. And... and I'm his niece, Velma Banning. Are you quite satisfied, Mr. Randall? Uh -huh. I guess so. Then get on with your business. Very well. When are you going to finish your manuscript, Mr. Bannon? In my manuscript? Yes, the one you haven't finished. Uncle has no unfinished manuscript. Why, no. I explained to Mr. Gregory that I hadn't started the proposed book and that I did not intend to write anymore. 
Mr. Gregory was under the impression that you'd already started it. Well, no. That is... Uncle I... Thomas has given up writing. He's been having trouble with his eyes. Um, this is rather an odd time of the night to be out of business. Well, I'm sorry if I've inconvenienced you. Please accept our apologies, Mr. Fanny. Uh, quite all right, young man. I, I'm sorry I can't help you further. Help me? I, well, I mean, I'm sorry I can't write anymore. But if my eyes improve, I may be able to do something again. You understand? Yes. Yes, I think I do. Well, thanks for the interview, Mr. Banning. Good night. Good night, Mr. Randall. Come again later on. Good night. Good night. I'll show you to the door. Good night. Well, what do you think of that, Andrea? It's Banning, exactly as I saw him in the vision. I still don't like it. Did you get the meaning of the situation? No. What do you mean, Herbert? Oh, I sensed it the second I walked into the room. You would. What was it? Thomas Banning was lying about that manuscript. Did you notice how he was too buttered in and led the conversation? He's afraid of them. They've got him cornered for some reason. He was afraid to speak the truth. It... Say, look. Yeah. What is that, a grave? It certainly looks like a grave. Herbert, it is a grave. And freshly dug. A small one, but just about right for Thomas Banning. Oh, Herbert, what do you mean? And look, look over there. Another one, but filled in. You can tell by the way the grass is sunken. Come on, let's get out of here. There's certainly something strange going on here. Herbert, Herbert. Now, now, take it easy. They're killing him. We've got to stop no, them. No, no, wait. There's nothing we can do at the moment. We wouldn't have a chance. Come on, let's get back. Herbert, what is it? What's wrong? There it is again. And I'm wide awake. I heard it again. Oh, I didn't hear a thing. The manuscript. You've got to get the manuscript. He reached me again. Oh, please, Herbert, please, let's go. Yes, Andrew. We'll go now. So Andrea and Herbert go home. Andrea goes to bed, but Herbert sits up, concentrating, waiting, waiting for another contact, another message. But Andrea, try as she might, and cannot go to sleep. Please, Herbert, please come to bed. I can't go to sleep with you sitting there staring in the face. Give me the willies. Oh, I can't sleep. I couldn't possibly. He may not appear again tonight. He doesn't have to appear. This is no spook business, I tell you. He can reach me instantly. Please, Herbert, at least turn out the light. Oh, very well. Sorry to upset you, darling. But I've got to follow this through. I've just got to. Thomas Banning. Thomas Banning. Thomas Banning. Find the manuscript. Mind over matter. Get the manuscript. You must get the manuscript. You must. You must. You must. The next morning, Herbert is up early after a sleepless night and pays another visit to Mr. Gregory of Gregory House, Thomas Banning's publisher. I'm Herbert Randall, Mr. Gregory. I was here yesterday to get the address of Thomas Banning. Yes, I remember. Well, uh, I'm with the Parapsychology Laboratory of State University. We were interested in knowing if Thomas Banning is planning another book. Well, we've published all of his works and expect him to do another. About six months ago, he wrote us that he had one half completed and hoped to finish it shortly. And you've heard nothing further about it? Yes. I talked to him a few weeks ago and asked him what he intended to do about the new book. He said he'd abandoned the idea of any further writing because of his eyes. Said he hadn't even started on the book. Hadn't started it? But he told you previously that he had it half finished. Yes. He seemed reluctant to talk about it, so I dropped the subject. I don't like to say this, but it occurred to me that Banning was, well, slipping a little. Mentally, I mean. Losing his mind? Is that what you mean? Yes, Randall. So I thought it better to say no more about it. He seemed to be terribly dis depressed. Uh, have you any idea what might have caused such a condition? No. It may have been brought on by the disappearance of his brother. I'd never met the brother, but he had come up from South America. Been living there for many years. A few months after his arrival, he vanished. That's all I know about it. I see. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Gregory. I guess we'll just have to forget about any further works by Thomas Banning. Good morning. <laughs> Mr. Hellman, I understand you're Thomas Banning's banker. 
I am? What about it? Well, Randall's my name. I, uh, I'm a psychologist. I am working on the case of Thomas Fanning. Then he is crazy. Crazy? No. No, but he is ill. Suffering from a severe emotional disturbance. Oh, I see. Uh, what made you jump to the conclusion that he was crazy? Well, I, I, I don't know. Uh, you're a psychologist. Well, what so had he I... done, Mr. Hellman? That seems so strange. Well, he, he came in here in a terrible hurry one day and drew out all his money. Turned all his assets into cash, except the country place, walked out. He acted very nervous, very queerly. I knew something was wrong with him. I figured he was losing his mind. Mm hmm. Now, was that before or after his brother William disappeared? Oh, I think it was before, but I'm not positive. Uh, tell me, did you ever meet his brother? No, I was a bit surprised to learn that he had a brother. But he'd been living in South America for 20 years. Mm hmm. Did the brother have any children? I understand he had a son who came with him, and the son brought his wife. I know about it. I see. Uh, Thomas must have had a considerable amount of cash. Yes, he left here with something like 100000 in large bills. 100000 mm. uh, Then you would say that such actions indicated that something was wrong with him, that he was decidedly not his normal self. I certainly would say that. I think he concentrated so much on spooks and the supernatural that he just cracked up over his subject. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Hellman, for the information. You're quite welcome. Oh, by the way, uh, who, who did you say you were? Uh, Herbert Randall. You can check on me through the Parapsychological Laboratory of State University. Good morning, Mr. Hellman. That evening, Herbert and Andrea drive once more to the Banning Estate. They arrive, turn in at the gate, and as they drive up the lane... Look. Well, what do you know about that? That mound of earth is gone. The hole's been filled in. Good heavens, then they've already killed him. Oh, you're probably right. Oh, they're desperate, Herbert. They'll do anything. Let's don't go in there. No telling what they'll do. Please, Herbert, let's go back. Well, here we are, Andrea. Come on. I don't remember seeing any servants here last night. Well, they probably don't want anybody around. Not even us. Yes. Oh, good evening. I wonder if we could see Mr. Banning again. Do you always attend to business at night, Mr. Randall? Well, no, it just so happens that I... Come in. I'm afraid my uncle is retired. He's not very well, you know. It's quite a long trip down here. If he possibly can, I wish he'd see me now. He's here, isn't he? Of course. Uh, just a moment. I'll speak to my husband. Careful now, Herbert. Anything might happen. I know that. I'm prepared. I've got my gun. Will you step into the library? You stay out here, Andrea. Come in, Mr. Randall. Yes. Come in, Mr. Randall. Mr. Banning. Uh, good evening, Randall. Well, I... I... Oh, well, how are you? Didn't you come here to see Mr. Banning? Oh, uh, yes, but I... You I... seem so surprised. What do you want this time? Oh, well, I, I want to talk a little further about the book. Couldn't I possibly see you alone, Mr. Banning? <laughs> You're going to start that again, Randall? What are you so worried about? Go ahead and speak your piece. I'd prefer to talk with him alone. You're just a bit of a nuisance, Randall. Very well. I'd like to know why you won't finish your manuscript, Mr. Banning. He told you he hadn't started it because of his eyes. He could dictate it. He's too ill to concentrate on writing a book. Is that true, Mr. Banning? Well, yes, I have been ill lately. But I... if you hadn't started it, you, you'd have gone to the extent of completing the research for it. Your discoveries are important, Mr. Banning. We need them. If you'll just outline your research to me, I'll write it for you. You owe that to the profession. Uncle is in constant pain. He is? I'm terribly sorry about that, Mr. Banning. And he doesn't feel in the mood to have someone around prodding him all the time for information in order to publish a book. But he does want the book published. And he wants me to help him, I know. You're a conceited sort of individual, Randall. I know what I'm talking about. He wants me to help him with that book. Do you, Uncle? Well, I would like to write the book, but... What? I uh, really don't see how I can under the circumstances. What circumstances? His physical condition, of course. Uh, look, Mr. Banning, maybe I can help you about this so-called physical condition. I don't think it's really a physical condition. I think it's a mental condition. Mental? Yes. I think you're really mentally ill. What do you mean? I think he's emotionally upset over the death of his brother. Who said he was dead? Well, he disappeared. It's presumed that he's dead. 
Shortly after his brother disappeared, Mr. Banning gave up his work. He wanted to give the benefit of his research to science, but he just couldn't collect his thoughts. Go on, son. You loved your brother. And I'm sure that I can help you get at the root of your seeming trouble and enable you to finish your book. But he hasn't started it. Then I can help him start it and finish it. Oh, believe me, we need that research. We need the book. Who is we? The field of psychology needs it. So you're a psychologist, Mr. Rath? Yes. Then you'd better analyze yourself. Uncle hasn't said a word about wanting you to help him write anything. But he does, I know. He tried to contact me, didn't you? Ridiculous. He hasn't phoned or been out of the house in weeks and weeks. He knows what I'm talking about. Now I ask you. Uncle, have you tried to get in touch with this man? Have you? No. There you are. I understand, Mr. Banning. Don't worry. Uh, however, if Uncle wants you to stay and see what can be done... Why, that's entirely up to him. Do you, Mr. Banning? Uh, Yes, I'd like you to stay. Very well. Whatever you say, Uncle. Velma, put them up in the east wing. Uh, Where's your room, Mr. Banning? Why, uh... In the west wing, Mr. Randall. The hours of the evening pass. Herbert and Andrea sit in their room in the Banning house waiting. Still waiting for another message. Another contact Herbert is confident will come now clearer than ever. Then you think that he hid the money on the estate and they're trying to force him to tell where it is? Yes. When I drove up the driveway tonight and saw that hole filled in, I felt sure they'd killed him. But they wouldn't do that until he told them where the money was. Since the hole was filled in, it stands to reason that they've only been digging in an effort to find it. But what happened to the brother? Why would the nephew do away with his own father? Well, maybe he didn't. Maybe Thomas Banning had something to do with that. An argument over the money. You mean Thomas killed his brother because the brother was trying to get the money? Oh, it's possible. Anything is possible. And if the brother was as nasty as the nephew, I wouldn't blame Thomas Banning. But the climax will come tonight. The nephew and his wife are suspicious of us. They know they'll have to work fast. What a situation. Oh, please go to bed, Andrea. Let me concentrate on this thing, and I'm sure I'll have the answer before morning. Very well, Herbert. Good night, dear. Now, long past midnight, Herbert, half asleep, sits in a big armchair in the bedroom in the east wing of the huge house. Then Herbert begins to stir. Herbert Randall, Herbert Randall, the manuscript, mind over matter in the library, law's shelf on the right, mind over matter, law's shelf on the right, get it now, get it now, get it now. Library, lower shelf on the right. Andrea. Andrea. What is it, Herbert? I got it. I got the message. The manuscript is in the library. Lower shelf on the right. Come on, quiet now. Turn on the lights, Andrea. Lower shelf on the right. Here we are. Oh, I hope they can't see the light from the other wing. Please hurry. I'm frightened to death of all this. I wish we hadn't come here. Here it is. Look, here it is. Mind over matter. He did start it. And it's unfinished. Stopped at page 313. Then come on. Let's get out of here before they catch us. Andrea. What is it? Look. Look, Andrea. Here in the middle of the script. Two $50,000 negotiable bonds. Good heaven. Negotiable bonds. Why, it's the same as money. Anybody can cash them. So that's what he did with his money. This is what those two were after. This is why he's been kept a prisoner. This is why they've been torturing him. Poor man. Come on. I'm going to the West Wing. Maybe we can slip into Banning's room without them knowing it. It's unlocked. You stay here in the doorway and keep a lookout. All right, but hurry. Um, uh, what is it? Quiet, Mr. Banning. Uh? I've got to talk to you. Oh, oh. What is it, Randall? I finally got the message. It was as clear as could be, and I found it. I found the manuscript. You found it? Yes, in the library, just as you said. Then you'd best take it and leave here quickly as you can. It isn't safe for you here. But I can't leave, not just yet. You must leave. Take the manuscript and go. But it isn't finished. You can finish it. You must. Please go before it's too late. But I can't finish it without the research material for the rest of the book. There isn't time for that. You have the manuscript. Please go at once. No. I know what's going on here, Mr. Banning, and I refuse to leave. Those two, your nephew and your niece, are doing? They're keeping you a prisoner. 
torturing you to make you tell what you did with the money. Don't stay here another minute, Randall. I'll go, but I insist that you go with me. The manuscript is the important thing. You have it. So get away from here as fast as you can. Not without you. Now, come on. I... I can't. I can't leave. Why not? What's to stop you? I... I can't walk. Can't walk? What do you mean? I can't move. They... They've been injecting something in my back. It paralyzes from the waist down. What? Then I'll carry you out of the place. Please go. They might hear you. I'll have the police here in a matter of minutes. Hello. Hello. Dead as a doornail. You've seen to everything. Now, do you believe me? You haven't a chance against such desperate people. You have the manuscript. That's the important thing. Get it safely away from here and then do whatever you like about them. All right. I'll get out now with the manuscript. But I'll be back with the police in half an hour, sooner if possible. Yes, but please hurry, Randall. Come on, Andrea. Back to our room. Get our clothes. <laughs> hurry, Andrea. Step on it. I am. I am. Oh, dear. I wish that phone was working. Say, maybe this one is. Maybe just that one extension was pulled on. Does it work? No, no. It's dead, too. They're all dead. Oh. Come on, Andrea. Let's go. Yes, I'm ready. I'm ready. Oh. There it is again. Did you hear that? Oh, heavens, yes. They must be wise to us. Probably heard us, and they're going to give him the works this time. It's their last chance. Oh, I can't stand it, Herbert. It's horrible. I I'm can't... not going to let them torture that old man any longer. I'm going back to his room. Oh, then I'm going with you. Come on. Careful now, Andrea. Stand back when I open the door. All right. Mr. Banning. Mr. Banning. Randall, why haven't you gone? You must go. I heard you scream. I can't go and leave you to be tortured to death. But the manuscript... Oh, hang the manuscript and the money, too. They'll be safe. The money? Yes, the bonds. Don't worry, I'll take care of them. You... you found the money? Yes, pasted in the manuscript. But I refuse to leave here without you. Andrea, take this manuscript and go back to our room and lock yourself in. I'm going to wait here for those two to come back. Do you hear me, Andrea? Yes, yes, I hear Well, then hurry. Herbert. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Andrea. Did you hear that? Yes, I certainly did. It came from another room. The same scream? The same scream. What does it mean? Give me that manuscript, Andrea. Mr. Banning. Mr. Banning. Yes, son. Yes. You remember the number of the last page of your manuscript? No. No, I can't remember. I, I just can't. On this last page of your manuscript, you began a new chapter. There are two paragraphs here. The last paragraph says... In other words, there are certain positive relations and certain negative ones between extrasensory perception and other processes of the mind. Is that your last paragraph? Yes, that was the last paragraph. You must carry on from there. Get up out of that bed, Mr. Banning. You're lying. No, no, please believe me. You're lying. There are not two paragraphs here, only one. And the words I quoted are not here. They're from a textbook by Professor Rhine. Get out of that bed and start walking through that door. Herbert, do you know what you're doing? You see, he can walk. And don't make a false move, Banning, or I'll shoot. Now through that door and down the hall. Oh. All right, Banning. Open that door. Randall. Put up your hands, both of you. Now get away from that bed. Who is this man? Herbert, look. His hands and feet are tied to the bed. Yes. But take a look at his face. Why, Mr. Banning. Exactly. A little thin, but it is Mr. Banning. Untie him and be quick about it. Mr. Banning. Mr. Banning, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. You're Herbert Randall. Thank God you got my message. I knew I could get through to you. I knew. And you got the manuscript. Yes, yes, I have it here. I only got to page 313, one paragraph ending. Therefore, I am positive that thoughts can be transferred from one mind to another, regardless of distance. Right. Word for word. Uh, you, you have the manuscript and the money, the two bonds. Yes, what do you want me to do with the bonds? As you see fit, my boy. Then this man is your brother, William? Yes. Uh, hey, don't talk anymore. I'll add the rest. These two are not his nephew and his niece. They're his son and his daughter-in-law. They came from South America. They knew you had money and decided to get it. You suspected it, withdrew your money, turned it into bonds and hid it, knowing that even if they did go to the extent of killing you, they'd have nothing but this house. When they learned that you'd withdrawn your money, they held you prisoner to force you to tell what you did with it, where you hid it. That's why they dug holes all over the estate. You're absolutely crazy, Randall. You had me all fooled for a while. I thought your father, William, was dead. I figured you two were holding Thomas a prisoner. And you were. But all the while, William was posing as Thomas. 
And he got away with it because Thomas and William were twins. Twin brothers. What of it? We're still his heirs. The money still goes to us. We'll let the state decide that. Don't worry, Mr. Banning. Everything will be... Mr. Banning. Mr. Banning. Hmm. He's dead. It did? But, but we didn't kill him. The state can decide that, too. This is a wonderful testimonial for parapsychology, gentlemen. And you three are going to have the opportunity to bear me out in my statements. It's a shame it had to happen in this way. But since it did, I'm proud that he selected me to help prove his theory. Why he did, I'll never know. But I'm grateful to him. Very grateful. Yes, Herbert. You're grateful. And as to why he chose you, you'll know when you turn to page 213 of the manuscript Mind Over Matter. There's an insert pasted there. Go on, Herbert. Read it. Twenty years ago, my wife ran away with another man, taking with her our young son. I never heard from them again. But last week, I learned the whereabouts of my son, who had assumed the surname of his stepfather. Since my brother William has returned from South America, I fear for the safety of my life and my fortune. I know they plan to kill me since they have learned of the existence of my son. So I have turned all my assets to cash and will them and my unfinished manuscript, Mind Over Matter, to my son, whose address is 214 East 32nd Street, this city. What? And whose name is Herbert Randall. Andrea, I'm his son. Herbert. If you get this, God bless you, my son, and carry on with our great work, which is destined someday soon to eradicate the boundaries of time and space. Your father, Thomas Banning. Just a chance coincidence, you say? That's such a convenient explanation for the layman who doesn't understand, and safer, too, to be skeptical and conservative. But one mind can reach another regardless of time or space. And you will agree with me someday. I know. <laughs> CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originates from Columbia Square in Hollywood. I, The Whistler, bid you good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Wait a minute. Have you heard the weird tales of the Whistler? Sunday night, and again, CBS presents The Whistler. I, The Whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And so I tell you the amazing story of House of Greed. Taxi cab rolls through the night and comes to a stop before a brownstone mansion on West 52nd Street. The driver opens the door. The handsome, well-dressed man steps out, pays the driver, 
slips quickly up the stairs, fumbles with a bunch of keys, but the door opens. Oh, hello, Jackson. Mr. Talbot, welcome home, sir. Where's Mrs. Talbot? Oh, uh, she left three days ago. Uh, went to the place in the Catskills. There's a note on your desk, sir. Oh, good. Your brother, Frank, is waiting in the library. Oh. Hello, Frank. What do you want? John. Now, look, Frank, I told you the last time I'd give you no more money. Oh, but it isn't gambling debts this time. I'm reforming. I'm going to settle down and work. <laughs> work? Hmm. I met a big cattleman from South America. He has a very lovely daughter. And she talked her father into letting me buy an interest in the business. How much? Ten thousand. Oh, I'm sure I'll make good, John. Oh, very well. I don't mind doing something like that for you. When are you leaving? Tomorrow. I've had a plane reservation for four days. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thanks for the check, John. You're a swell guy. Uh, tell Mary goodbye for me. Yeah, she's up in the Catskills. Yeah, so Jackson told me. Goodbye. Good Lord. What's wrong? She hasn't gone to the Catskills. I I can't understand this. What on earth does she mean? Well, what is it? Well, read it. John, this life is too lonely. I can't go on like this, so I'm leaving you. I found someone else who is more considerate of me. But I... First, I'm going home, and from there, it doesn't matter. I'm sorry, but things just didn't work out for us. Mary. Someone who's more considerate of her. Why, I have given Mary everything her heart desired. She must be out of her mind. Uh, of course, you have been gone a lot, and women get crazy ideas. I had snuck the pins right out from under me. Yes, I can see that. Better take it easy for a while. Yes, I feel, I don't know, kind of sick. All of a sudden, nothing seems to matter. Well, maybe she'll wake up before she gets too far. Perhaps I'd better cancel my trip for a few weeks until you get straightened out. No, 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 never mind. I'll, I'll pull myself together. I wouldn't have you sidetrack your plans for the world. I think you'd better go now, Frank. I'd rather be alone. All right. But uh, don't do anything foolish. What do you mean? Well, if you brood about it, you're liable to get some crazy ideas and end up really holding the sack. Good luck, Frank. Lots of luck. Thanks. Goodbye, John. John sits for the remainder of the night, staring over the top of his desk. The next morning, he closes the house and starts on Mary's trail, which takes him to London, Paris, Berlin, all over Europe, but to no avail. Finally, he drops his active interest in his business and goes to live in his country estate. Then one day, 14 years later, he finds himself on a honeymoon. He has married a widow named Helga. Well, John, dear, we got away without too much trouble. Well, it does seem a bit silly, rice and honeymoons at our age. Our age? Well, you sound as though we're a couple of old grannies. I'm 36 and you're 45, and I certainly don't feel old. Why, of course you're not, Helga. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. John, now that the wedding's over, there's something I haven't told you. Oh, I, now I... I well, I, I, I haven't said anything because I was afraid it, it might make a difference. I know what it is. You have a son. How did you know? <laughs> I wondered when you were going to mention it. Oh, well, he finishes school this year. It's been quite a struggle putting him through college. But he's very bright. Paul has studied hard and managed to cram two years into one. Could he spend the summer with us? Why, of course. Oh, John, you're a darling. I should be able to find a place for him in the business. Oh, ask him to come down to our place in the country. Oh, thanks, John. You're wonderful. <laughs> so Helga's son, Paul, came to spend the summer at the country place... And he stayed the next winter and the following summer and the next winter. Now it is summer again. And Paul is still visiting his mother and stepfather. The first year he worked in the office every day until noon. Found business very boring. So finally he quit going to the city at all. But mother, I've looked the whole thing over and there's nothing there that interests me. Well, you can learn about the business. You seem to be able to learn anything else you want to. But I don't care for business. Oh, you're a fool. I worked my knuckles to the bone to give you an education. I married John Talbot to give you a chance, a chance to do something. John has no children. It's a huge business. And one day you could control the whole thing. 
I'm disappointed in you, Paul. You're letting me down. Well, it seems to run very well without too much attention from him. If we were to uh, inherit it, why wouldn't it continue to run just as well? You either get down to that office or you pack your things and get out. Why should I? I'm perfectly satisfied. I'll tell John to make you go. And suppose I tell him what you just said? That you married him just to give me a chance? Married him for his money? Who wouldn't be? And uh, suppose I tell him that you were never divorced from father, that he's still down in South America, still wandering around trying to find a gold mine. If you dare open your mouth, I'll... Oh, hello there. How are you, Helga? What's this I heard about South America? Oh, why, why nothing, darling. Paul was just talking about someone he met from down there. Who do you know from South America, Paul? Oh, uh, oh fellow, I met him today. Were you in the city today? Uh, no, uh, it was down the village. I didn't suppose you'd been out of the house today. What's his name? Why, uh, I don't remember. I didn't think you would. You haven't been out of this house for three days. Paul, I think you're the laziest man I've ever met. All right, all right. I'll start back to the office Monday. If that's what you and Mother want me to do, I'll do it. I'm sorry I wasn't here for dinner, Helga. I was detained in town. I have quite a bit of work to do. I'll be here in the library for two or three hours. Very well, John. I, I won't bother you. I'll go on upstairs. Besides, I want to have a little talk with Paul. Good night, dear. Good night, Helga. <clears throat> what on earth? Who's out there? Why? What do you want out there? May I come in? I want to talk with you. So why do you come to the library windows? Why didn't you ring the bell? I, I didn't want to cause a disturbance. Disturbance? What do you mean? May I come in? Yes, yes, come ahead. Don't you know me, John? Oh, Lord. Mary. I'm sorry, John. I had to talk with you. I saw the light in the library. What do you want? I... I need your help. Where have you been all these years? Oh, every place. Are you still filled with resentment? Been too long ago. At first I was. I followed you all over Europe, but never quite caught up with you. Now I'm glad I didn't. No telling what I might have done. I'm sorry, John. I was a fool. I know that now. <coughs> May I sit down? Why, of course. Are you okay? Yes, I can't seem to shake it. I've had it for weeks. See, I hate to mention it, but you look a bit shabby, Mary. Aren't you doing well? Oh, yes. Yes, I'm doing all right. Are you? You've uh, married again. Yes. You are with her? Yes. Then I'll be as brief as possible. I, I wouldn't want her to know that I was here. You want me to help your husband? No. Not that. I have no husband. What about the man you said was more considerate of you? He left me four years after the baby was born. Baby? You have a child. Yes, John. She's 17 now. And where's the man? I don't know and I don't care. Oh, John. I made the biggest mistake of my life. I should have known better. But he practically carried me off my feet. And I learned later, to my sorrow, that he was not worth shooting. Where's your daughter? She's in a school in Vermont. I've worked hard to give her an education. I've done everything I could do to give her a chance. I've not seen her very often. But now, well, I... I'm sort of cracking up. I've been ill a lot, and... I seem to have trouble getting a job. Job? What kind of a job? Why, any kind of a job. What have you been working at, Mary? Oh, John. I made such a miserable mistake. I was never able to face things. I always took the line of least resistance. What a shame. But now I've come to the end of my rope. Joan has finished school. She's a lovely girl, John. I can't let her know. I can't take her with me. Why not? She deserves so much more. She deserves a chance in life. I want you to do something for her. Well, why should I? Because she's your daughter, John. Yeah. My daughter? Yes, yours and mine. She was born seven months after I left. Here's the birth certificate. Please, John, do something for her. 
She shouldn't be made to suffer for my mistake. She's innocent. Well, does she know I'm her father? <laughs> no. She doesn't remember the other man. Here, I'll give you her address. Fernwood College. And, and I'll write a letter to her explaining all about you. Well, I... I... Oh, John, you could do so much for her. She's a young lady now. And I love her. Please see her. I know you'll fall in love with her. All right, Mary, I'll see her. I'll have her come down here. Oh, John, John, I'm so sorry. So sorry for everything I've done. Please forgive me. I've forgotten everything, Mary. Oh, wait a moment. Take this check and do something about that cough. No, thanks, John. I won't need it. You better take it. Thanks. I'll be all right in a few days. The cough will be gone. Good night, John. Good night, Mary. If he brings this girl here, do you realize what it means, Mother? Yes. It's his own daughter. If he falls for her, if he, if he likes her, he'll change his will and split the estate. She's entitled to it, isn't she? Now, why should she be? Strange girl he didn't even know existed. Popped up out of nowhere and cheats us out of half the estate. I know what you mean. We've been here for several years. You're his wife. It isn't fair. What would you do about it, Paul? I'd see that she didn't get anything. How would that be possible? Suppose she, uh, she didn't like it here. Supposing that before John got attached to her, the things happened that would make her dislike everything here. If she runs away soon enough, he won't change his will. Perhaps you're right. And if she doesn't? Then maybe something could happen to John. And later, something could happen to the girl. But in any event, the will must not be changed. Where do you get such ideas? <laughs> that, Joan, dear, is the story of your mother. I trailed them all over Europe, but never quite caught up with them. You mean you planned to kill them? Kill them? I was filled with revenge, but I finally gave up the chase and returned here to wait. I knew that sooner or later she'd show up. But it's been so long ago... Surely you've lost the desire for revenge by this time. Time heals many wounds, my dear. If you had caught up with them and satisfied your revenge, what good would it have done? Quite right, my dear, quite right. Tell me, have you no recollection of this man? You can recall nothing about him? Absolutely nothing. Remember, I was only four when he went away. And you do believe that I'm your father? What else am I to believe? Mother proved that with the birth certificate. Proved that I'm Joan Talbot, not Joan Evans, as I've always believed. Of course. And would you like to remain here? Why, yes, I, I think I would, well, but There seems I... to be a doubt. Why do you hesitate? I don't know. From all the evidence, I, I belong here. I, I have a legal right, but... Well, I can't seem to find words to express it. Express what? From the moment I stepped in the door of this house, I've had a, a strange feeling... A cold, chilly sensation of, of fear. Well, is it something you feel about me? Yes. You're afraid of me? No, I, I don't think so. Is it Helga? Well... Is it Paul? Oh, please, please don't ask me anymore. I don't know what it is. Well, what has Paul said to you? Nothing. No one said anything. It's just a premonition of, of evil. There's something wrong with Something horribly wrong in this house. Oh, you're imagining things, Joan. It's all in your mind. It will pass as suddenly as it came. You're young, Joan, impressionable, and you suddenly found your life turned upside down. A new environment to which you've never become accustomed, but you'll get used to it. You're my daughter. And I want you to have what you deserve, what is rightfully yours. I understand. And I'll try to overcome this feeling. Yeah, that's better. You're a lovely girl, Joan. An intelligent girl. I know I'm going to be very proud of you. Thank you. I think I'll go to bed now. Well, it is rather late. Good night, dear. See you in the morning. Hello. Paul, what are you doing here on the stairs in the dark? I wanted to tell you something. What? You're very, very beautiful. Your eyes. Your hair. Just like 
gold, golden beans, and salt. Oh! And your throat, your throat is slender and soft. I... Take your hands off my neck. Paul! I don't know many girls. Girls don't like me. Let me buy. You don't like me either, do you? Well, I... I know. I can tell. Elsie didn't like me either. She was afraid of me. Who's Elsie? She was a girl. New village. She worked here in the summertime. No one knows what became of her. What? I don't remember what happened to her. Her throat was slender and white like yours. Let me by! Why do you stay? I can't leave. It's too late. But you must go at once. Do you mean that Paul? That's part of it. And what else? John. John? What about him? I can't tell you. But you must believe me. What about my father? I don't believe he is your father. And he's planning to get revenge on your mother through you. I don't believe you. I won't. Get away while you have a chance. No. I won't run from it. I'll face it, whatever it is. Now it is nearly midnight. John still works at his desk in the library. Outside, a man steps softly through the trees upon the terrace, quietly opens the library doors, steps in. Hello, John. Frank. Good Lord. Yes, yeah, Brother Frank. <laughs> well, why don't you say something? Come in, uh, get out or something? Why, why, come in, Frank. You barely knocked me off my feet. I didn't know whether you were alive or dead. It's been a long time, John. Why haven't you written me? Well, I was hoping I could make a go of that ranch and pay you back, but... Uh, I guess I was just born unlucky. Oh. They had a revolution and cleaned Senor Gonzalez out and me with him. It's too bad, Frank. But you're still the same steady, reliable job. Yes, sir, I've tried my darndest to be like you, but... Man, it just isn't in me. I don't have what it takes. The last two years, I've had a pretty tough time. I caught some sort of a malarial fever down there, and it's impossible to get rid of it. It's recurring. You certainly don't look well. You've aged quite a bit. You better have Dr. Richards look you over tomorrow. <laughs> She's still kicking around? I thought he'd be gone long ago. How's your new marriage turned out? Oh, very well. Very well indeed. Good. Ever hear from Mary? Yes. She came to see me. I knew she would eventually. She was broke and quite ill. She'd had a tough time of it. And you helped her out. <laughs> you would. You couldn't turn anyone down. Well, she was mainly interested in my helping the girl. She had her in a school in Vermont. And so now you're taking care of both of them. What else could I do? Good old Joe. I sent for the girl and brought her down here. She's a lovely child. Sweet as can be. And you'll give her everything her heart desires, I suppose. And then you'll have another problem on your hands with Joan. A girl 17 either wants to get married or go to college. Oh? I've decided that. <laughs> really? I'd like to send her to Wellesley. Good. There isn't every man who can have... Just a minute, Frank. I'll be right back. Well... What are you doing out here in the hall at this time of night, Paul? Oh, well, uh, 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 Mother sent me down to see why you hadn't come up to your room. Oh. Well, you tell her I'll be up in a few minutes. Yes, uh, yes, don't tell her. My stepson, Paul. His mother thought I was staying up unusually late. Oh, well, I'll run along. Good heavens, it's after 12. Now, when's the last train back to the city? 12 o'clock. You've missed it. Well, when's the next one? 5 a.m. 
Oh. Well, I suppose I'll have to wait for that. Can you put me up? Yes, of course, Frank. Oh, thanks. Well, wait a moment, Frank. I probably won't be up when you leave, so I'll give you this now. Oh, now, John, I uh, I didn't come here for that. Hmm? I... Well, that is not exactly... <laughs> no, you never have. Here you are, Frank. A thousand. And see Doc Richards first thing in the morning. And drop in at the office and let me know what he says. Thanks, John. I... I'm sorry to have to take this. I, I only wish that... Oh, forget it. We're not kids any longer. You're too old to learn new tricks now. Run along to bed, Frank. I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, uh, take the guest room at the head of the stairs. Good night, John. See you in town at noon. Night, Frank. The clock strikes three as two figures slip down the darkened hall and quietly enter John's bedroom. Then a few minutes later, the same two figures make their way in the moonlight through the trees to the back of the estate carrying a long, gruesome bundle wrapped in a sheet. Now it is three nights later, and Joan, Helga, and Paul are in the library as Joan paces back and forth anxiously. But where could Father have gone? He didn't say a word about going out of town. Well, maybe he doesn't want to come back. Why not? Uh, I don't know. Maybe he doesn't like it here. Should have listened to me. But you didn't say anything about... Well, well, you just mentioned me. It was a mistake. I just had a weird feeling of intending to do Something is wrong, I know. If I didn't do anything, if I could leave, I'd not stay another moment. Who knows what will happen? I know. What do you know? I know what will happen next. They always happen in twos. Many people have come here, stayed a while, and then suddenly disappeared. What time is it? There's a train at 12. I'm leaving here. Hello? Yes, this is Joan Talbot. What? Good heavens. Where? Yes. Yes, I understand. Yes, I... I'll be here. Yes. Who was it? I, I don't know. I've never heard anything like it. What do you mean? There's a man and he... What man? He said he had a message for us. And he'll be here at 12 o'clock and... to wait for him in the library. The police? I don't know. He said he'll come to the garden window. To the library window. Who could it be? I don't know. But we'll wait. I'm going to see this room. Here he comes. Through the garden. Who... Who is it, Mother? I, I don't know. The lights... Why did you turn out the lights? I turned them out so we could see outside. Who is he? I don't know. He, he, he's up on the terrace. Who, who are you? What do you want? I came to talk to you. What about? About what happened here at three o'clock in the morning several days ago. Nothing happened. Nothing. But something did happen. Turn on the lights. No, don't turn them on. You couldn't see me if you turned on the lights. Oh, good Lord. Was it you who phoned me? I spoke to you, but I didn't phone you. Mother. What happened in this house at three o'clock several days ago? A man was murdered. What? Paul. Turn on the lights. Turn on the lights. Joan Talbot, open the top drawer of that desk. Now take out the paper. It says, on the night of August 5th, we, the undersigned, murdered John Talbot in his bedroom and buried his body on the estate. We didn't. We didn't. It's John. It's John. Sign it. Sign the paper and I'll go. Sign it, Paul. Sign it. You did it. You killed him. Sign it. You help me. You sign it. I can't. I can't. Turn on the lights, Joan. John. It's, it's him. It's him. 
He isn't dead. No, Paul. Then we didn't. Paul, what happened? I'll tell you. You killed my brother Frank instead. Come on in, Sergeant. You heard it all. Yes, we heard it all. Father, what on earth happened? When you phoned a while ago, I almost fainted. I was sure you were dead. I knew from the moment you told me you were frightened in this house that something was wrong. I put two and two together and realized what it was. They didn't want you to share in the estate. I knew they were planning something on that night. And then my brother came. He accidentally got into my room by mistake. And they killed him instead of me. I saw them carrying his body through the trees. So I disappeared for a few days and evolved this plan. You've nothing to worry about any longer, Joan. Nothing. No. <laughs> nothing to worry about. But the truth would certainly amaze you. All that Helga said about Paul and John was true. John was planning revenge, but not through Joe. That night your brother Frank came back. You discovered something, John. What was it Frank said? And then you'll have another problem on your hands with Joan. A girl 17 either wants to get married or go to college. It was then, John, that you knew the truth. The only way that Frank could have possibly known that the girl's name was Joan and that she was 17 was to have been with Mary. So John knew then that it was Frank who ran away with Mary and deserted her when Joan was four years old. And then, John, knowing that Helga and Paul planned to kill him, deliberately let Frank occupy his room on that fateful night. John's revenge was satisfied, and he didn't have to turn a hand. <laughs> That's all. CBS has presented The Whistler. And now an important announcement regarding a change of time. Beginning one week from tomorrow night, on Sunday, September 13th, The Whistler will come to you at 9.15 p.m. Remember, Sunday, September 13th, at 9.15 p.m. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originates from Columbia Square in Hollywood. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Whistler. Now the Whistler's strange story, Murder in Paradise. High in the Sierra, the lone hawk circled over Mirror Lake, its beady eyes fixed on a white patch moving slowly through the blue waters below. From the narrow road that ran along the lake's edge, another pair of eyes followed the patch of white. Watched the girl emerge from the water and remove the white bathing cap. Saw the mass of red hair fall on Pan's shoulders, now glistening in the bright sunlight. The eyes belonged to Danny Williams, who stood there looking at the girl in the yellow bathing suit. Then as she sat down at the edge of the long wooden pier, he shifted the heavy suitcase from one hand to the other and started through the trees toward her. As he emerged at the edge of the lake, he walked into the range of another pair of eyes, looking through field glasses, trained on the scene from a point a quarter of a mile away. Hello. I'm looking for Paradise Inn. You know where it is? Huh? You a salesman? Do I look like one? You went away. Are you? In a way. I don't think they'll be interested in buying any brushes. Thanks for the tip, and I'm still looking for the inn. Got a cigarette? Sure. I'm smoking it. 
How'd you ever get to be so charming? Look, Red, they told me in the village the inn was a mile up the road. So you know. Why come to the lake to ask me? It was a bathing suit. In the road, I couldn't believe it. Like it? Could have seen more material in a pen like that. <laughs> the inn's over there. Take the side road. Thanks. See it? Nothing wrong with my eyes. From the way you've been staring at me, I thought you might have strained them. A quarter of an hour later, you arrive at the roadhouse. A low white frame building sitting back silently in the shadows of the giant redwood. This is it, isn't it, Danny? Paradise Inn. Where you're going to spend the next three months pounding the piano for Johnny Hedges. Your first job, Danny, since the prison gates closed behind you. Gave you back your freedom. And you've made up your mind that it will never happen again. You're going to stay out of trouble. That's all you can think about as you cross the parking area, mount the wooden stairs, and walk along the veranda. There's a musty odor in the air. You set your suitcase down by the front door. The entrance hall is empty, silent except for the buzz of flies against the sun-drenched window. You make your way across the deserted dining room, past the battered upright piano and push open the swinging doors at the far end of the room. The short, gray-haired man at the sink turns, peers at you over his glasses, and then begins to wipe his hands on the soiled apron. Hi, young fella. Hi. Where'll I find the boss? Oh, he'll be around. You, uh, must be the new piano player. That's right, Danny Williams. Williams. Danny Williams. You never heard of me before. I'm Gus Peters. I do the cooking. Uh, sit down, sit down. Sir. Thanks. He didn't meet you at the bus stop, huh? Who's he? Mr. Hedges? Hedges? No. Hmm. Uh, how about a cold beer? You look like you could use one. Got any milk? Milk? Say, you sure you're the piano player? I said I was. Ulcers? No ulcers. The cows need publicity. Yeah, okay. If that's what you want. Why didn't somebody meet me at the bus stop? A long hike out in this heat. Well, I can't drive for one thing. Never could learn how. Slade is still sleeping, I guess. He wouldn't go after you anyway. And the boss had other things to do. Mm. Must have outside interest. Ain't business so much that keeps Mr. Hedges busy. It's keeping up with his wife that's got him going. His wife? Yep. Don't let her out of his sight much. Hey, you want a sandwich or something? No, not that. He doesn't trust you. Real jealous, you know. Thinks every man he talks to is going to take her away from him. How about a piece of pie? No, 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 this one, girl. Yeah. We sure have been having a fast turnover of piano players around here. They, uh, couldn't stay away from it. It's the, uh, the perfume, huh? Uh-huh. Yeah. <clears throat> Then only two men around here who ain't ever been bothered by Mrs. Hedges. Me and Andy Slade. You'll meet him. He works here in the bank. How does he manage to resist? Ain't never been able to figure it out. He's strictly business and a natural cold fish. Uh, you leave your stuff on the veranda, Danny? Yeah. I'll take it up. Your room's in the attic next to mine. Don't bother. No bother. Just going upstairs in a few minutes anyway. Take a little snooze. Any objection if I try the piano on for size? No, go ahead. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I guess. Uh, Danny. Yeah? Stay away from her, son. Just stand to your piano and you'll be all right. Yeah. Yeah, sure. This is what you sell. Yep. Strictly music. You, uh, you play very well. Much better than the others. Thanks. I knew you would. I could tell by your hands. They're different. I bet you were a child prodigy. I was born a poor but honest peasant in the Bronx. 
My mother scrubbed floors so I could have piano lessons. She thought I'd become a concert pianist. It didn't work out. Don't cry. I just made that up. Who kicked you while you were down, music man? Look, Red. The story of Danny Williams is sort of dull. He wouldn't be interested. Now, why don't you go back to the lake? Very rude. Business is business, Mrs. Hedges. Oh. Oh. You know who I am? Yeah, the boss's wife. Period. And what does that mean? It means I need the job, and I don't like wives that are on the prowl. Oh. What a fast with your mitts, aren't you, baby? Not Johnny Hedges, if that's what you're worried about. Relax, man. My name is Slade. Andy Slade. I got the gambling concession out back. Welcome to paradise. <laughs> It's an unusual job, isn't it, Dan? One of the strangest you've ever had. You never bargained for this sort of thing when you first accepted it. Johnny Hedges' roadhouse at Mirror Lake didn't seem to suggest the danger and intrigue that suddenly presents themselves. Lucille and the way you met her on the boat dock. The warning from Gus. And now the coldly calculating gambler, Andy Slade, stands at your side with the strangest greeting you've ever received. Said William, you're off to a great start. But here only and now, and the boss's wife slaps your face. Uh, political discussion, wasn't it? Yeah, you might call it that. Now, some dames get mad if you don't whistle at them. Anything else on your mind? No, nothing. Except the boss wants to see you. We've been up there in the office listening to you. He thinks you're good. And you don't? Well, I keep telling him he'd be better off with a jukebox. Nobody ever heard of a jukebox making a play for a dame. You, uh, know what I mean? I know what you mean. Just let me give you a tip. Save it. That's all I've been getting ever since I come here. Okay, okay. It's your funeral. But, uh, Hedges is getting a little sick and tired of hearing the wolf call. You said he thought... wanted to see me. Yeah. Up the stairs there on your right. Thanks. Oh, uh, William. Yeah? It's nice to have you with us. I think you'll get to like it here. That is, if you stay long enough. Come in, William. Come in. Your gambling concession said you wanted words. That's right. I just want to iron out a few things before you start. Now, you're an ex-con on parole. That's been ironed out the past three years, Sir Carol. I'm here to play the piano, and that's... Yeah. Yeah, that's all you hear. Just remember that. Some of the others didn't. So I love music. Well, I'm glad to hear it, William. I'm glad to hear it. It'll save us both a lot of headaches. All right. Now, you'll play in the dining room from 8 till closing time. You take the breaks to suit yourself. Won't be a lot of people in the dining room. Sometimes there may not be any at all. I'm not fussy. And another thing, you might as well know from the start. I don't make my money from the dining room. Not much on the bar either. I didn't think it did. We got a place fixed up in the back. Dice table, roulette wheel. Andy Slade runs that end of it. It's not going to affect you one way or the other. Sure. Well, that all? Yeah. Yeah, you, you met everyone, have you? Yeah, Slade and Gus the Cook. And my wife. You were talking to her down there on the pier a couple hours ago. Yeah. No one picked me up at the bus stop, so I had to walk. I was asking directions. Uh-huh. All right, Williams, just remember what I said. You stick to your piano play and we're going to get along fine. If you get bored, let me know. I'll buy you a book.
That night, you play for a half a dozen couples in the dining room. And more than once during the evening, your thoughts turn to Lucille. She means trouble, doesn't she, Danny? And you don't intend to have any. You're going to stay clear of her. You're going to play it safe with Johnny Hedge as her husband. You have no intention of winding up in the lake with a bullet in your head or back in a prison cell. In the nights that follow, you become accustomed to the habits of the paradise customers. Learn when to be on hand, when you can slip away for a quiet smoke or a chat with Gus. And then one night in the middle of the second week, you go out on the veranda and light up a cigarette. Hello, Danny. Oh, hello. You've done a good job these past ten days. Thanks. Of staying away from me, I mean. They catch on quick. You don't know what it is to feel out of place. Go for drives all by yourself. And just walks along the beach. You do that? Almost every night after the customers leave. The cove on the North Shore. Why? Oh, I don't know. Get away, I guess. From your husband? From myself, maybe. I don't know, Danny. I'm just confused sometimes. Yeah, I'd say so, too. Excuse me, will you? I gotta go confuse some customers. You leave her, Danny. Go back to your keyboard and the cocktail concerto. But somehow through the evening, the haze of music, the laughter in the smoke-filled room, is something that haunts you. Keeps drifting back like broken parts of an old refrain. Almost every night after the customers leave, cold on the North Shore. It stays with you, Danny, that night, and into the next until after you finish playing. Unable to fight down the urge, you... You find yourself slipping away, taking a rowboat and crossing the lower tip of the lake in the half-darkness. At the cove, you look around and there's no sign of her. You call yourself a fool and wonder why you came out here. When you promised yourself to stay out of trouble, you're about to, you're about to turn back when... Oh, oh yeah... You can step right out here. Yeah. I pull the boat up, boys. Yeah, that's better. I really don't know why I came. I'm glad you did, Danny. Glad to have somebody talk to you. But I don't want to get you into trouble. Any harm in just talking? He wouldn't think we were just talking. Forget about it for a while. Sounds nice, Lee. You know, Danny... You're not as hard as you pretend. No? If you were, you wouldn't have rode way out in Newton. Danny. Yeah? Don't do it again. You lose your job. I lose a job and you're going to on each time. But he can cause you trouble. Danny, you've got to ignore me. Act as if I didn't exist. If it's any other way, you won't last here. Not at all. Is that why Slade lasted? Slade and I hated each other from the first. Johnny knows that. That's why he gives Slade anything he wants. Nice guy, your husband. Charming as a meat ass. Please, Danny, I want you to understand the case. I think I'm going to avoid you. Danny, why did you come here? Why? I don't know. I don't know. Boy Scout instinct. There's nothing we can do. I can't lead him. He'd follow me. Bring me back. What if you didn't want to come back? You don't know him. He'd kill me, Danny. I know. Believe me, I know. Maybe. Maybe not. Anyway, Lucille, give me a little time to think about it. You're in a tough spot. Maybe I can help you. I got a merit badge once for pathfinding. When you leave her, Danny, you start the long row back across the lake. You remember a promise. One that you made to yourself about staying out of trouble. And you ask yourself if this is the way. When you arrive at the boat dock, you're convinced that it must end right here. And then going up the path toward the roadhouse, you pass a small cottage in back of the inn. And suddenly you're aware of voices oh, arguing, I mean, and you I stop to listen. Look over on the lake. You met some guy. Oh, don't leave. I didn't know. Easy, son. What? Where are you going? Gus. Uh -huh, I've been waiting to warn you. Hedges knows she met somebody. Good thing you didn't ride back with her in the car. Come on, Danny. Let's go back to the inn. Look, Gus, I Come got... on, Danny. 
Yeah. Yeah, I guess for a minute I have the crazy idea I should be butting in. You better stay clear of that setup, Danny. He's his wife. Not yours. I just play the piano here, yeah, sure. That's what you get paid for. Okay, okay. Just forget everything else, son. Forget everything. Except that you're the guy who wants to stay out of trouble. <laughs> If old Gus expected the passage of hours to make any difference, he was wrong, wasn't he, Dad? Even without seeing Lucille all that next day, you can't get her off your mind. The struggle within you goes on, and the following night as your hands move across the keyboard when you entertain the late dinner crowd... Shortly after one in the morning, she comes in, moves quickly across the room, and as she goes past you at the piano, there's a quickly whispered message. I've got to see you, Danny. Out back. Come as quickly as you can. You continue playing as if nothing happened. You've made up your mind, haven't you, Danny? You know it was a mistake meeting her at the cove, and you're not going to repeat that mistake, are you? I had to see. Sure. Oh, Danny, I can't stand it any longer. Danny, someone's coming. Ah, uh, hello. Easy. I thought I told you to stick to your piano playing music, man. Leave us alone, Lucille. Go back inside. Oh, Danny, I'm afraid. Go on. Yeah, beat it, Lucille. It's right now I'm going to go to work on him. <laughs> As Johnny Hedges comes out of the darkness after you, there's a flash of a knife blade. You lunge for it. It's like a nightmare, isn't it, Danny? All out of focus, unreal. A strange, struggling sensation. There's the fleeting memory of the knife falling on the path. And then movement over which you have no control. Blows falling, exchanging, a dull thud. And then... Danny. Danny, you all right? I hit him, Gus. He met me and I hit him. With this... I know Drop it, Danny. Drop it. Come on, son. You've got to get out of here. No, wait. He's still alive, Danny. You've got to get away before No, it he... was self-defense. I can tell him that. They won't believe you. You're an ex con Doesn't and... make any difference. Don't leave me like this, no matter what happens to me. I'm going to get him to a hospital. Come on, help me get him to his car. Still alive. And I've got to try to keep him that way. <laughs> Somehow you manage to get him into his car. And through it all, you know that Gus is right. The trouble you wanted to escape, you're now inviting, asking for. But as you back the car onto the road with hedges in the seat beside you, all you can think of is saving him. And then suddenly you're aware of Lucille at the window of the car. Danny. Danny, what are you doing? I've got to get him to a hospital. He'll die no, if I don't. Danny, they'll arrest you. They'll say you killed him. With self-defense. They won't believe you. can't let you do it. Please, Danny, if you love me, you'll leave him here and get away. Love me, Danny. Taking him to the hospital, Lucille. Danny! Danny, no! She leaps back as the car moves forward. You catch a fleeting glimpse of her face, white, drawn, concerned, and then it's gone, and you're aware of hedges beside you, breathing softly but steadily. And as your foot presses down on the accelerator, you realize that your own strength is fading fast. The struggle, Danny, the pounding you took, it's telling now as you fight to hold the car on the road. Moments later, a flash of light caught in the rearview mirror. It blurs your vision. In the haze, the fog that envelops your brain, you think you hear Lucille's voice. Her face seems to float close to you out of the darkness. Danny! Stop the car! No, no, Lucille. Danny, the curve, look out! You coming around, Doc? Yes. He's going to be all right. 
I better call the lieutenant. You sit there with me. Lieutenant. Please. Take it easy, son. Yes. What's your name? The hospital today. You've been unconscious for over 12 hours. Hedges. Look. What about Hedges? Hedges is dead. Trouble, Danny. You were headed for it the day you walked up the road to Paradise Inn. No matter how hard you struggled and tried to avoid it, it was there all around you, closing in. Because you couldn't stay with your music and leave Lucille alone. He couldn't help it either, could she, Danny? You're sure of that. But it doesn't matter now. Because instead of helping her, you've ruined everything. Her husband is dead and you'll be blamed, won't you, Danny? They'll never believe it was self-defense, not with your past record. You lie back on the white hospital bed. The doc will be bringing the police back in a minute. Yeah, yeah I know. Hedges. Well, this is it. I have to tell him, Gus. You don't have to tell him anything. You didn't kill him. You only knocked him out, Danny. He broke his neck in that car crash. You were crowded off the road, son. What? Lucille Hedges. She was trying to stop you. Lucille. Is she all right? No. She was killed, too. Oh. It was my fault, because she was in love with me. No, she I... wasn't. You played it straight. She didn't. She framed you, Danny. Set that meeting there behind the roadhouse with you, knowing her husband would find you together. What? She wanted you to kill him. Didn't care what happened to you. I don't believe it. Son, that's why she didn't want you to make it to the hospital. She wanted him dead. But, Gus, I... It was so she could be free for the guy who was driving the car after you last night. He was killed with her. Oh. The one guy nobody figured. Slade. Andy Slade. Uh, the only guy she was ever crazy about. The Whistler has been a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal.